2024. Board members may attend and participate in board meetings by electronic means or in accordance, in accordance with policy BMEA um, and state law. Kara, could you please call the roll? Chavez? Here. Medler? Here. Nisnik? Here. Quinlan Iweda? Here. Rajpal? Here. Sergeant? Here. Unger? Here. Motion passes. who is going to read our land acknowledgement this morning. Boulder Valley School District resides and operates on land that is the ancestral homeland and justly and illegally taken territory of the Ute, Puebloan, Arapaho, Cheyenne, Apache, Navajo, and 48 other tribal nations historically tied to this land who have called this land home since time immemorial. We acknowledge the atrocities committed here, including the painful history of genocide, forced assimilation, and efforts to alienate the indigenous inhabitants from their homeland, supported by the policies of the United States government. BVSD is aware of the many indigenous peoples, past and present, and their dignified nations and cultures who care for the land with strength and resilience. BVSD recognizes the history of the land in Colorado and the survival of the many nations that carry their oral traditions into the present. It is BVSD's responsibility to educate ourselves, our communities, and our students so that we can embrace the wisdom and knowledge of indigenous peoples and actively stand together to address injustices. In offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm and honor the history, wisdom, oral traditions, and resilience of indigenous people and recognize the responsibility to care for and appreciate this land together. Thank you, Elenia. I'd like to remind everybody that the mission of the Boulder Valley School District is to create challenging, meaningful, and engaging learning opportunities so all children thrive and are prepared for successful, civically engaged lives. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. <laughs> We're glad to have you observe and participate in our meetings. At this time, um, is there a motion to approve our agenda? So moved. Moved by Kitty, seconded by Jason. Kara, would you please call the roll? Chavez? Yes. Medler? Yes. Nisnik? Yes. Quinlan Aweda? Yes. Rajpal? Yes. Sergeant? Yes. Unger? Yes. Motion passes. We will now begin the work session portion of today's meeting. Um, today we'll be studying one specific topic, which is the strategic plan and UIP and associated metrics. Dr. Anish would like to give an introduction. Good morning, everybody. Well, to celebrate our first 9 a.m. board work session, thought it would be good to kind of wake everybody up. So excited to be here today uh, with you all. Uh, I'll start with some introductions from folks on our team and then talk to you all about our best hopes for today um, and, uh, and, and just start to jump right in. We've got, we have three hours scheduled. There's a lot of content to go through, a lot of decisions for us as a governance team to make, a lot of guidance, a lot of direction. Um, I think our staff has done a really good job of, of getting us to a point that then we need to take as a governance team and kind of figure out where we're going. And so um, today, obviously, you all know Laura. She's our deputy superintendent. Uh, joining us this morning is Chris Brecht, our director of strategic initiatives. And you may have not met Chris before. Uh, Chris has been with our team for, for multiple years and has been instrumental for our academics team to uh, man he, he aligns the project management, makes sure that all of the pieces are working together so that there's coherence within our system. You all know Jonathan, our executive director for assessment and program evaluation. And Claire is our senior data visualization designer. And uh, in her role, she has been tasked with really starting to dream about what could a set of metrics uh, look like that a you know create the transparency within our community that i know that is important to all of us also to help to drive outcomes and just think about you know the you know what data do we have available how do we visualize it to what extent what granularity do we need to get to drive improvement so claire will be presenting later on this morning um, 
And so those are the folks on the team. And Kara Phillips, you all know Kara? Kara is, is here for Laura, who is on vacation, a well-deserved vacation, I might add, um, and works in the superintendent's office. And so um, we have, uh, I think that um, we've got some big goals for today. First and foremost, we wanna make sure that we get this format right. Uh, we want it, be, it to be conversational. We want it to be, um, for these day-long work sessions, uh, feel different than a, a typical board meeting. I would say that in our presentation, we've been really mindful about preparing content, but also preparing for the conversation that will go around some of that content. And so, you know, as we as we check in after today and during today, make notes, board members, of what worked, what didn't work. These are things that we want to adjust. I think that you know, in our prioritization. It was a priority for all of us to, to create these different type of working environments for our board. And so I wanna make sure that we get that right. Um, you know, we're gonna talk about this through line between strategic plan evaluation, as you all know, that was conducted last year, the DAC recommendations, which again, I think that we've all really recognized as thoughtful and meaningful and important, um, and then UID development and then um, thinking about that through line as, as how do you take all of that information and boil it down into um, areas that you can communicate, that you can train to, and you can hold yourself accountable to. Um, we'll, talk a lot, we'll talk a little bit about the data that we need, what we have, and what we need to go try to get in the sense of making sure that we are on track for improvement. And again, we'll talk about that in terms of availability, granularity, uh, frequency, and I think that all of those things, I think that we prepared information that we can talk about that. Um, and then we'll, we'll just do a walkthrough of some of the data types and some of the samples of what's possible with our data and our visualizations and, uh, and work you through that. And so a couple things, I have a couple of assignments today. We're gonna need a timekeeper because even though we have three hours, I do worry that, that you know, the conversations will be rich and deep and I don't, wanna, I don't want to um, compromise that, but that means that we're gonna have to move along. So, e uh, okay, Beth, there, there you go, timekeeper. Okay, so um, just, make, just mindful that we're trying to end at noon. I'm guessing we'd wanna have a break somewhere in between, depending upon where we are. I don't know where that break is gonna be. Again, this is less of a, of a, of a scripted and planned and more of a conversation. And um, I would say that, you know, given what we've shared today, today what our goals are for today, would love to hear reactions from board members. It can be a thumbs up, it could be a sideways thumb, it could be a thumbs down. Are we on point? What else, what else was it that you would hope to try to accomplish today? Um, and so just some feedback before we get going so know if we're making, we're hitting the mark or not. So if I can do just a quick, one of my teacher tricks, right? If you're, if sounds good, thumbs up. You got some questions, thumbs sideways. Th sounds like I really messed up, thumbs down. Okay. Oh. Oh, okay, I thought you were just messing with me. Okay, all right. Uh, so, that being said, Chris, next slide. Off to a strong start. Uh, so, Chris has got it. It's, that's, it's the clicker's fault for sure, not his. Um, all right, so there's four big, I think we can break the conversation up into four big buckets for information that we would share. Um, I do think that for context, you know, as we're, we're talking about changing the way that we measure, changing the ways that we roll out strategy, uh, it, could it could be beneficial for us to start with a few slides on how what we've done has moved the needle and in what areas. And so this isn't all of our successes and failures, this is only things that we would lift up as we feel like that these are very positive signals based on the work we've been doing within the, our strategic plan on outcomes that many of which were aligned in our old strategic plan metrics. And so we could start with a feel good and a celebration. I would say that we, in preparing for this meeting, there was a lot of back and forth on what's embargoed and what isn't. And so they're releasing the embargo today on much of the achievement and growth data across the state. And so where typically I might create context to give comparisons to other districts uh, comparisons to state, comparisons to metro, comparisons to like districts. I don't have that data for you today only because it hasn't been released and that information will be released today. Uh, you'll see, you, you'll probably see a lot of that in our planned September um, rollout of, of the CMAS presentation of results. 
Um, but if it's okay with the board, we'd love to kind of run through some of the things that we've seen, right? And again, thumbs up, thumbs down, yell at me, whatever it is that you all want to do. All right, Chris, so let's, check, let's, uh, let's, let's lean on that clicker and see how we're doing. So the first thing, when I, when I started in 2018, at the time, one of the biggest frustrations of the board was there was lots of presentations and talk of improved strategies and efforts with data that never moved. And if you were to look historically at the data, three, four years in a row, things stayed about the same, regardless of improvement efforts. And so I'm really proud of this, of this fact. When you look at the number of students who meet or exceed uh, expectations in both CMAS math and CMAS ELA, and collectively, if you're to bubble that together as a group, that the district is performing higher than it ever has. Since CMAS was rolled, and I think it's like 2014, Jonathan, is that? Or 2017 is, 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 is as far back as we're going. Uh, on the, the, the vis that we, that, that we have, we can go back about that far. We get into some times where there was an algebra test you could take yep. if you were in seventh grade. So, so it gets a little tricky back in there. I would say to Jonathan's credit, we're really careful um, not to lift up improvements that we don't feel are genuine improvements that are anomalies and things of that nature. So you know, we, we have to be kind of mindful of that. But that to me, um, more kids at or above benchmark uh, it, that's a sign that things are heading in the right direction. And with our growth, uh, I think that as, you, as you'll see growth, and we don't have the growth as prepared for you all today. Some of this is, is replicated from what we did um, at our first DLT. But high growth will stable or increase growth inclusive of students of color and free reduced lunch eligible. So we're seeing, you know, again, I, don't, I can't compare our subgroup growth to the subgroup growth across the state only because that data has been embargoed. We can only look at what we have but we're very happy with our growth and it's leading to increased achievement. Uh, and so I think that that's something that we certainly wanna celebrate. Um, one of the things that it was a, a real important piece of our metrics, our UIP discussions during our last UIP and our strategic plan was this idea of disproportionate discipline. Now I will say that our discipline is still disproportionate, but the thing to celebrate is that we've reduced suspension, out of school suspensions for Hispanic Latino students by 51% since we started our All Together for All Students strategic plan. And I think that that's certainly notable. Uh, not done, still have work to do, but I think that what you would see is that we are making progress in I think what's an incredibly important area that is not just isolated to the idea of, of suspensions, but it's also, it also is connected to student achievement. Kids that are suspended, kids that are, are out of school, kids that are out of classroom uh, can't learn. We have pretty technical views that we look at um, on a monthly basis internally through a, a, a meeting that we call Vortex. Uh, and we've really um, used uh, d this data visualization internally to really unpack what's happening. And as you could see over the past two years, you could see the, the significant year over year reductions in the number of out of school suspensions. Now, if you're at school at 11.30 a.m. on a Wednesday, you probably have a higher <laughs> likelihood of being, of being suspended or doing something to get you suspended than any other time. Uh, and, it's, but it, and so that's data maybe not as actionable, like you can't like, but, but I think the monthly data is actionable for sure when you see that there's um, the upticks uh, in um, over time and then during a course of the year. I would point you to uh, 22, 23, and board members, you might remember this at the time, we were reported out to the board of um, around at our first strategic plan metrics presentation that our, our, we were becoming more disproportionate and the data was trending in a way that we didn't like, right? Some of you all might remember that. Uh, and then we made some interventions and changes and so you can see that dark blue line go above and then below. And so, so this is actionable, like we can do things with this. Uh, quick question: <coughs> Is it possible to get a copy of the this deck? Because Kitty yeah. and I are both having problems reading it. Do we not have copies of, of that for everybody? Everything attached to the agenda. Oh, okay. well, but you. sorry, I didn't see it. It's okay. All right. Um, so in any event, uh, 
Go ahead, Kitty. You got a question? Or? Well, you know, we do. On <laughs> sometimes if it's a trip, an out-of-school trip, sometimes if it's a, an athletic event, right, sometimes those things happen over the weekend. You know, we, we could share with you additional data. What we do know that we've increased not only restorative practices, but the proportionality of our restorative practices. Um, and we've increased the focus on alternatives to, to suspensions. And we feel that that is, is at the crux of, of, of these improvements. And also paying attention, minding the store, knowing that this is something that's important, tracking it, measuring it, and intervening as, as, as needed. Um, as we think about the percentage of Hispanic Latino students in advanced courses, yes. Oh, go back, Chris. Sorry, yeah, real quick before moving on. Um, I, I really appreciate this view to see kind of change over time and the way we've kind of addressed it and being responsive. Um, and this is your monthly Vortex meetings so, so you do this sort of data granularity. Mm -hmm. um, to, to what degree do you talk a, l a little bit about um, the types of things that students have been yeah. suspended for and kind of that variation and kind of what's getting restored for justice versus what's getting you know, this last step. Yeah, no, I do think that, that we get into that level of detail in those meetings. Um, and I do think that there are some codes that are more subjective than others. And we've really provided, tried to provide guidance to our teams and, and information to our teams on that. Um, and I think it's something that you have to continue to watch. And I, one of the challenging things, you know, the, 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 the lay of the land on the ground is that sometimes some of those, there's multiple codes for an incident. Right, there's not, sometimes an incident is, includes like a disrespect and a fighting, or sometimes there's, things are multiply coded. So, you know, that's, some, that's a nuance that you have to think about and work through when you're trying to make, you know, decisions at that, at that scale. And so, uh, we do have those conversations internally. I do think that it's something that we'll have to continue to pay attention to and, and, um, and dial in on. Um, and so, yes, but that's, great, that's a great question. Uh, Lelania. Do we track uh, reports to law enforcement? Yes, we do. We do. And uh, we, tra that we track like? arrests, reports to law enforcement. You know, before we started with our new safety and security plan with our school safety advocates, like 100, I think 140 referrals to law enforcement. I think last year, maybe a dozen. So we've all but eliminated. Uh, we, um, we have all but eliminated unnecessary reports to law enforcement. Now, I will say this, right? There are things that we need to report. By law, you have to report, and, and we should. And there are things where you should be suspended, and you should be expelled, right? There are certain standards for behavior in our system, and that does not, in no way comes in tension with, like, we, we're using restorative practices and alternative suspensions in ways that are responsible, allow kids to learn from their mistakes, in a way that allows them to continue to access their education. Uh, but we're not saying you can't suspend kids, you can't expel kids, you can't arrest kids. Like that, those, I'm really clear in Vortex in those meetings, you have to have a level of order and expectation for behavior. But there's also, when we get out of our own mindsets on what has to happen for what, and we try to be more inclusive and restorative, there's better solutions that we've been able to roll out at scale in the district. Uh, Hispanic Latino students in advanced courses, you know, this is, we're slowly ticking up, you know, between, and if you notice in the pandemic, if you notice in these graphs, I probably should have put like a little break mark between the slides. It goes 17, 18, 18, 19, but 19, 20, and 2021 20, are removed because the data sets were COVID impacted. Uh, but, you know, again, three years steady increase in making sure students get access to advanced courses, both in elementary school, middle school, and high school. Uh, and so that's, I think, a point of pride. Again, a metric in our, few, in our former strategic plan, something that we've been focused on. Uh, when we look at it from in regards to disproportionality, getting better, not there, right? But improvements. Uh, and this past year, I mean, we're, we are, we are um, very close to being proportionate in our leaders of color compared to the demographics of our school district. I would say that this is a point of pride and a point of frustration is that our teachers of color, that percentage has not budged. 
So percentage is not budged. Good news is we've been working hand in hand with BVEA. I believe we have an MOU to kind of think about some of our change, adjusting some of our hiring practices to see if we can begin to budge this. But of all of the data that we have in the school system, you know, I regret to inform you that that is a piece of data that our strategies, our initiatives, our expectations have not budged it. And uh, it's something that we need to continue to work on and focus on. I think there's a lot of elements that can that that, that play into that. Um, Either way, it's something that we know is important. Research is incredibly clear on the benefits of that, especially for our students of color, and it's something that we're not letting go of that we'll continue to focus on. Go ahead and start clicking. And I would say that, and for those of you that attended graduation ceremonies where the, where the, where the principal recognized students who earned one of these, 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 um, these honors, uh, these criteria, uh, you'll, you'll know that almost 83% of students are graduating with something more than a high school diploma. And as we get into some of the data looks that, that Claire has uh, later on where you can see some of the granularity of that, you'll get to see that, you know, the, the, the ramp up and what this looks like year over year. Uh, so um, incredibly, uh, incredibly proud of this, uh, this data point for us. And just it's, it's really neat when I think that um, you know, you see a core initiative in a strategic plan, and this is one of our core <coughs> initiatives around post-workforce readiness. And then you can see initiative to resource to direction, expectation to implementation. Uh, and you can see something that's really impacting kids directly. So again, point of pride uh, for our team. And uh, for those of you that had a chance to see that in graduations, it was really kind of neat to see that visualized. And, uh, and you know, just changing what is post, you know, it's not just college, right? There's, there's other things you can do and everybody should be prepared. Kitty? So the numbers in the squares are, don't add up to 83% of our population, right? Gra it's graduate, it's, it's seniors. Graduate, oh. Seniors. Duh, thank you. That's okay. How many, Need seniors? How many seniors do we have? Sorry, like 2,300, 24? We can get to that number specifically. Yeah. Seventeen percent more than the number we have okay. there, Alex. How does that? <laughs> how does that work? Okay. So then, what? So this is is this new, right? So as we t talk about granularity and lifting up successes at the school level, you know, I think that this is something that's come up in conversations around, um, you know, how how do we learn from folks that are growing faster than other other schools? How do we learn from schools that are stuck and not making the progress? How do you s establish outlier criteria to be able to look at and learn? And you know, I'll, I'll lift up some schools here that over the net past three years have, have increased the number of students at grade level um, by 5%, right? So you think about a little more than one and a half percentage point increases per year. And this is something that I do for our leaders to lift up you know, what is transformative work in buildings. Right now, what, what, <laughs> what schools are doing is, is something that you have to dig into a little bit deeper. Like I think that, you know, it can be leadership, it can be buy-in, it can be clarity, it can be resource. There are a lot of reasons why folks start to do things that allow them to improve. But I do think that it's interesting to see, you know, some of these schools that have, that have um, that improved. And I think the thing that's most interesting for me is that we have high support schools, targeted schools, and flexible schools. Remember, we've created this criteria based on past performance. And when you have a Douglas next to a Cole and Pioneer next to a BCSIS next to an Eisenhower, it tells me that the conditions that we've created in our school district allow everyone to get better. Right, like for me, right, like we talk about what's in the superintendent's purview and control, creating those conditions for people to be successful, right, so they're not fighting against the system, that the system is lifting them up. That's what I take away from this graph in ELA. And Chris, if you wanna kinda keep going forward. Um, and in math, it's even more impressive. Now, if you were to look at statewide improvements in math, that, that this is more on trend, I would say, than the, the in, from what I understand the trends will be in regards to, sta to just the statewide improvement. But again, I mean, you've got similar schools, some of them with leaders that have been in the school for 15 years, some of them that are new leaders. 
I just think that it, it speaks to what we learned in the evaluation, which is keep doing the things you're doing, right? Be a little bit more intentional, be a little bit more focused, and we'll talk through that a little bit when we talk about our through line, but I just think that this is interesting for elementary schools. For middle schools, um, again, in, in, in ELA, I think that, uh, you know, maybe not as big of a, of a, as of a concentration, but, but more improvements over, year, over three years. And then go to math, and, and this is exciting for me because middle school math was probably when you looked at our district-wide data for a, a number of years, it was the area that we were really struggling to kind of figure out how do you improve. Um, some of the things that we did with previous board's leadership and, and direction was we accelerated the, the adoption of new middle school math co um, materials and we adopted those and implemented those last year. I would anticipate that the full impact of that happens two, three years after you've, you've adopted something. And oftentimes you see when you opt adopt a new curriculum and implementation dip and then, and then um, improvements. But uh, we've got our finger on the things that we want to improve. We did something different and things are getting better, right? Those I think are all positive trends um, and things to learn from as we think about setting metrics and, and, and really establishing where we're going over the next five years. One thing I think is really fascinating about that particular chart is how drastic those rises were between 23 and 24, and whether that was the curriculum adoption being more aligned to standards-based standards um, uh, instruction, instructional practices, or whether the, the new content was aligned more to the state test. But it is remarkable between 23 and 24 how that really accelerated. Um, so it's exciting to see that what you're doing is really working when it is implemented with fidelity. When you remove the burden from teachers and schools on trying to figure out what they need to do to get better, and you hone it in and you resource it and you train to it, right? There's still implementation bumps, right? Change management is a tricky thing. If you've been doing something for 25 years and the 26 years somebody says, hey, do it differently, I don't care what context, it's hard to sort through and sort out, right? So, um, but you know, this burden of every school's gotta figure it out on your own, right? Every teacher's gotta plan, you know, a gazillion hours a week to figure that th these things out individually, right? It's finding the balance between autonomy and clarity and expectations. And I think that that is what we'll continue to hone over time. Uh, so thanks for that, Nicole, but I just, I think a, a good learning for us. High schools, if you were to compare our achievement at high schools against not only the Denver Metro, but like districts across the country, you'd find that our high schools um, as, as a whole are going to score in the measures on the state accountability system incredibly high. Number one, number two, uh, depending upon the groups that you'd compare them to. And so, the, so as you th as you see about you know you're not going to see the bigger I, I you're not going to see as big of improvements um, over time, but you'll see continuously high um, performance in those areas. And then uh, yes, Kitty. What is e -B -R -W? E -B -R -W. Go ahead, Jonathan. It's uh, it's e e evidence based reading and writing, which is what the College Board has called it. Uh, called the, the, the content area over time. I think they're going to reading and writing now, so. And then next slide, uh, and I would say that, you know, I would, I'd want for consistency's sake for you to see, you know, who's made big gains even though there's high achievement and uh, I'd really love to work up the, the work of, Cent uh, lift up the work of Centaurus High School. Looking at you, Dan. Um, yeah, but, 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 you know, again, clarity and expectations, uh, you know, great teachers doing the right stuff, really buying into the vision of a leader who uh, was really focused on improvement and equity. And, uh, um, and I would say that just as a nuance, Arapahoe Ridge, they have smaller end sizes, right? So just know that that is a, uh, you know, every one or two kids could be a percentage <laughs> point. And so, and we're, but we're gonna get into that when we look at the views. You'll see how end sizes and subgroups and how all those things connect as we think about what are the things that we wanna lift up. So, that's the uh, success, um, success uh, category. 
happy to open it up for any questions, thoughts, ideas. Is that helpful? Is that not helpful um, as we think about uh, moving forward with our conversation today? Helpful thumbs up. You want to talk about it sideways? Thumbs down if you want me to leave. OK. Um, all right. So. We didn't, we, we on purpose didn't like schedule out like 70 slides where we talk to you and ask you to react to what we think. Right, like, we, like, like so, so we've, we've broken this up in a way so it's more conversational, a little bit of voice and choice, you know, putting my teacher hat on for our board. Uh, I, I think that there is a rhythm of, of how we should have this conversation, but didn't want to, wanted to make sure that we had buy-in before we move forward to that and know that there's some flexibility. So think of this as your Jeopardy board, like these are the categories. Uh, we can talk about how we think DAC and strategic plan review and UIP potential um, focus areas align. Then we can talk about what data we have and how granular we can get today and get feedback on whether that works or not. And then we can talk about looks of metrics. Like we haven't cooked up the dashboards for the metrics. We've cooked up ideas and thoughts uh, with the idea that once Claire and, and Jonathan, they build these things, then they update, right? Like, so the work, you put the work in up front, right? So you want to get, you'll never have all the information you want, you want. You'll always have some questions as you dive deeper, but you'd want, you want a set of metrics that you can look at to see if things are going forward. So we can go alignment, data reporting, metrics, if that's okay with folks, unless somebody has a strong opinion otherwise. How are we doing, timekeeper? 30, 30, 30, 33 minutes in. Okay. All right. Everybody okay? Anybody need a break? Okay. All right, Chris. So um, our team has been hard at work trying to do a lot of sense making um, around the information we have, the, the recommendations from Shelley, um, how um, that will align to the DAC recommendations and how that can inform a UIP. But, Kitty. Are you talking about not the current DAC recommendations, but the ones that preceded the period of time we're talking about? I'm talking about the DAC recommendations that came to you in the spring. Remember Chris and okay, Allie? Yeah. Chris yeah. and Allie came, right? And again, I, I shared this with DAC, and, and I want to thank them again publicly for being so dialed in and in tune to um, how we could how we can potentially get better. Right now, as you align and you you know we have a crosswalk um, that we've provided to you in your handout that kind of talks a little bit about this in depth. And I believe in your handout you should have the DAC recommendations. They're here, right? So uh, you can see um, kind of how that works. And Laura, did you want to kind of take over and kind of go through this and? Um, and kind of just you know talked from from where you're at, yep. uh, and um, and then we'll have a conversation. And so uh, Chris and I will actually be walking through the next set of slides. We want to share with you areas where we see strong alignment, as Dr. Anderson said, between some of our proposed next steps with the strategic plan, as connected to the UIP, the developing UIP, the DAC recommendations um, from spring, as well as the strategic plan recommendations. Uh, which you also have a copy of in your packet. Uh, we really want to be as coherent and as streamlined as possible for our staff and for that balance, um, as Dr. Anderson said, between autonomy and clarity of expectations, and for our community as well. We want to be clear for all of the BBSD community. So we want to take a look with you at some ways in which we've aligned the strategies and the focus of the strategic plan, the UIP, which is in development while keeping, as I said, those DAC recommendations and strategic plan recommendations in mind. Uh, a little bit about the work we did to get here per the DAC recommendations to align all of these. Our team spent time cross-referencing those recommendations and cross-reference with our data trends, taking a look at the first five years of the strategic plan, outcomes, and looking at uh, where we've been, where we are, and where we're going. And that, that really created that crosswalk that you have a copy of. The development of the UIP strategies have come from both the intention to align and also enhance the work that's underway. So addition, in addition to this team uh, rolling up their sleeves and working hard on that alignment, we've gotten input from 
um, certainly Dr. Anderson, myself, our school leaders, and the executive team, and we're looking forward to getting input from the board as well. And with that, I'm going to let Chris begin talking about the areas where we see strong alignment. Good morning, board members. Thank you for having me. So as Dr. De La Cruz said, we wanted to really structure this in a way that we could see a clear through line from those recommendations as well as the evaluation that we received from Dr. Shelley Billig in the spring that you all had a chance to review as well. So this first category is through the recommendation of focus, this continued focus on prioritized standards. So um, really that all students are experiencing grade level standards based instruction. And obviously we know that there's high leverage strategies and included in with that are professional learning for both our teachers and our leaders, the ongoing implementation of data-driven instruction to know where students are in their mastery of the standards, mm -hmm. uh, and then supporting our leaders with focused observation and feedback to grow educator practice in this area. Um, we also see really strong alignment in, in the recommendations from DAC. So through recommendation one, data priority two, uh, facilitate deeper equity analysis and action, uh, shift one, culturally competent, sustained teaching and leading in every classroom. And then shift three as well, embrace universal access and shift four, champion inclusion and reject the soft bigotry of low expectations. So we see really strong alignment within this category and uh, we're really excited to continue in with that work and the implementation of that work. Pause for reaction or thumbs up, makes sense. Sideways, talk about it, thumbs down. Can I say um, that way back when I was on the District Accountability Committee, we were asking for this really clear alignment between the strategic plan, the UIP, and the, pra the practices, and it is great to really see the intent there and the uh, really aligning them for what feels like the first time, or maybe it's just articulating it very clearly for the first time that there's a high degree alignment, so everything that we're doing is really focused on the same goals. I would say we haven't always been great at this, right? I would say that this is a vast improvement and, you know, and I've worked with Nicole and I've worked with Jorge and now working with Chris and really embracing this idea um, of the District Accountability Committee is a critical thought partner to help us improve. And, uh, and to build and to, and to, and to m maintain that relationship, data transparency, data clarity, um, clear expectations and then consistency across the board. Uh, so as school advisory councils go to their school and principal and think about what they learn in district accountability, um, district advisory council or school accountability councils, um, that there's alignment. So when they see something at the district, they can expect to see some of those things at the school. Because that can, with, with tons of autonomy, that can get really confusing. Think about this, you're the SAC chair. You come back from the DAC meeting, hey, this is what this is doing. Yeah, but we're not doing that. We're doing A, B, C, D, and E. Well, why are you doing that? Well, fill in the reason, right? So um, I appreciate that. Alex. Uh, on that front, I, again, I think this is, the reason this is on a top pro on, the, on the list, I think, in terms of making change and in instruction and in the practice. Um, one of the things I'm interested to is directly to that point, which is having a good sense of, you know, how many functional SACs do we have? Mm -hmm. and having the metric of that so that we know that there is actually that, that step in the process exists in some of the places. And, and I think sometimes it's an issue of scale and history, and sometimes it's an issue of school culture not being into it. So like I would dive deeper into that, like where, where do we not have a SAC and how can we help that happen? Yeah, ag agreed, and I think the answer to that's all of the above, right? Like I think there are times when you know, ultimately it comes down to uh, superintendent's responsibility to set the conditions and expectations around this being something that needs to happen, right? Um, and then sometimes there are leaders who, have who either haven't put in the work or struggled to get people to participate. And then there are some leaders who have discouraged people to participate over time. I mean, if we're being completely honest. Uh, and, um, and so I think that what, what we've done in working with Chris, and I know they've done a survey and I haven't seen the results on, do you have a SAC, why or why not? Uh, and uh, the other work that we've done in this is we started the way to differentiated funding that we said, if you don't have a SAC, you don't get any money. <laughs> so that worked to get SACs, but are they functioning? Are they operating? Is it, um, are they working like the district and DAC are working hand in hand? Is that replicated locally? I think that that's the question to ponder. Okay, sorry, if, 
a timekeeper, you got to like, if we, if we, we have a lot to do, so um, I'm sorry if, if I'm going on, but tell me if I am, and I'll stop talking. Okay. So in keeping with that alignment of strategic plan to DAC recommendations to UIP, um, we looked carefully at our data patterns and established with conversation, not only with this team, also Dr. Anderson, executive team, and our school leaders, the, the, the root cause or the core issue um, being that some students are receiving inconsistent access to grade level standards and differentiated instruction from the adults in our system um, who have, limit, have had limited training in culturally responsive pedagogy and practices. And the performance priority we're wanting to tackle is the disproportionate academic achievement and growth for what's currently named as historically marginalized student groups, which will likely evolve based on input from our community to naming specific student groups. Uh, black students, Hispanic, Latin A students, um, students who are experiencing poverty. And, um, and so there is an alignment to our data as well as an extension of root cause and student uh, performance priority from past UIP. However, this is an evolution which you're going to see in each of the UIP strategies that we share. <coughs> and this may be a moment to stop for conversation. Yep, Jason. I'm, I'm not sure, yeah, okay. Uh, I just have a question, I don't know if it's possible. How, how broad is that inconsistency if we're, if we're talking about inconsistency with access to standards and instruction? How could you characterize that? I mean, are we talking about some classes that really have no, you know, like there's very little evidence of that happening or is it a narrow, we just need to narrow it further? I, I think it depends. It's, that's the right question and a tricky question. Right now, if you were to look just solely on results, um, I mean, you've seen how many schools are improving in reading and math. Uh, um, I think that it's it's really it comes down to the consistent expectations, which are newer, right? Newer, right? Like we, after during pandemic, we rolled out a pr um, something we called Atlas, which was our first attempt uh, that I know of in the district to begin to start to align practices. And uh, we took a lot of feedback on Atlas. Uh, Atlas evolved into the instructional playbook. And I would say that where we have seen probably the best uh, alignment is where schools are really embracing data-driven instruction because it's, it's a practice that forces you to be aligned. Uh, it brings people together, right? And again, and, and I think it's a more effective practice than what others might do, which is a very heavy-handed, top-down approach which is on day four, you're gonna be teaching this lesson, we're gonna come around, check the box, whether you're teaching it or not. And I don't know that with the high quality of teachers that we have, I, I think that that would um, create chaos within our culture that would prevent any movement from happening. So um, I think that as we talk about strategic plan implementation measures, like we've gotta quantify that. And we've got some ideas on how you can do that, and whether that's you know, um, high level bu bubble ups of things we observe in classrooms, high level bubble ups of the artifacts of evidence of the levels of thinking and, and, and access to grade level standards <coughs> across, um, across classrooms. And so we will talk a little bit about some ideas on that, but to be able to tell you 78% of our classes that we went into were a lot, like we, we aren't there yet. Um, uh, so I hope you, hopefully that answers your question. Uh, I would just put this in, if there's a parking lot, I'd like to put in a parking lot. We have parking lot. <coughs> Do we have such a thing? Um, uh, I'm really excited and think we're going in the right direction and I really appreciate your insight into the data-driven instruction being the thing we can get such expert teachers behind and involved in. Um, I guess one of the things I'd love to see in the, like the budget presentations throughout the year is the link to how we're supporting that happening. Like I have two different neighbors who are ex-teachers who this year are basically data coaches, right? And so I'd love to be able to track back through the budget where we're carving out the money for the FTE for like the facilitation of that. So we can see that it's actually a substantive priority in the budget and that if like if it's the thing that has big change, then we need to prioritize that the, in the budget and the HR sort of decision making. So that's just one thing for the parking lot. Yeah, I think that's a great parking lot and great feedback and something that's 
that's incredibly doable, right? Like you can, you, well, you can quantify the FTEs that we have driving that, and then we have to quantify the level of adoption and implementation. And, then, and that's the thing we have to kind of think through. Um, I share your excitement around this. It's a small thing from the presentation that I wanted to kind of put a plug in for. Um, Laura, you were describing historically marginalized students. I just want to make sure we're also including when we drill down on our data. Uh, students with disabilities, students GT identified, and emerging bilingual students. I'm sure we're going to do that. That probably goes without saying, but just that's really important to me that we have that data in our presentations. Here's the great news. We're going to have so much data here in like <laughs> 20 minutes that we can look at and we can decide on, you know, how we look, how we report out, how we measure success, any way you'd want to slice it, right, as long as, as we can enter that into a data set, we can slice it and visualize it. And so. Yeah, um, how many schools are using DDI? Well, it's, it's, let me, let me answer that. Like, we have a certain set of schools, our UVA schools, right? We, let's think about it this way. If you have, there's different levels in which things are implemented. In some places, they're culturally embedded, right? So, for example, we were doing our Alicia Sanchez interviews. Right? A member, again, one of the lowest performing schools in Colorado five years ago. And when we talked to the staff about what do you need in a leader, what did they say to us? Well, here we do DDI. That's part of who we are. Right? Now, that's one <laughs> level of implementation, right? Like, that's the ideal. You have some that are on the path there. I would tell you another place where it's culturally embedded is Cole Elementary School. Right? Where when we go, and Jorge was, had a chance to go with us last year in our roundtables, right, all we heard about is how that's changed everything for them. So I think that it's, it's not who's doing it and who isn't. I think you could say most people are doing it in some way, shape, or form. Have they gotten to the place where it's not leader dependent or accountability dependent and it happens when nobody's looking, right? And that is when you th you've arrived, and those schools are the schools that continuously outperform, and I would suggest um, are outliers within the state of Colorado for the kids they serve and the performance that they're doing. So follow up on that. So for the schools that have been doing it but are not UVA schools, do they have DDI personnel like the UVA schools do? Depends. Okay. Some people have an instructional coach who leads the DDI work. Other people have somebody who's dedicated to that task and don't have other responsibilities. You know, I mean, and I think that there's a little variability in how this works at schools. But I'll let, I'll let Laura speak to it. That's my understanding. And many schools have brought on um, data leads or DDI coaches with differentiated funding. Uh, we're also with our strategic support um, teams providing additional data. DDI leads, and then we have district DDI leads and coaches. And so there really is a, a variety of ways that schools have support for either completely embedded or supported by district for conducting and implementing DDI. Uh, we do have um, expectations within our consistent expectations across all schools for DDI implementation. As Dr. Anderson said, those are at varying levels of implementation, and we're supporting an evolution from wherever the school is to its next step. And, and we also have um, instituted training at the district for our DDI leads so that we have built consistency in their practices and, and really built up their toolboxes so that the work that they're doing in schools is fortified with evidence-based practices. So because this gets to my <clears throat> follow-up question to that. So there isn't one single process for getting every school there. It sounds like we're working with each school where it is to move them towards fully embracing DDI. And how is that working? I, I think it's working well. Uh, and, and as we talk about change management and leadership, right? Like I think that this is the way we've been talking about it, the team. Like it's, it's a lot easier to diagnose the problems and issues and come up with the solutions than it is to actually implement the right solutions. Right? Like those are two different things, right? Uh, you could identify the problems, right? We've clearly identified, you do that through some root cause analysis. You can identify solutions through research base and what works. And then the, the art and science of change management 
is reliant upon who's in the building, how do you bring them along, what do they need? And I think that that can be nuanced. Expectations can be clear, but right, how long it takes to get you from where you, where you are to where you need to be is I think something that we have, we have to monitor. Uh, and I do think that school districts get this wrong all the time. They say, well, this is the right thing to do, everybody do this now with not enough conversation, not enough input, not enough time, not enough training, not enough resource, right? So I think that as Laura and I over the past three years uh, and Chris and everybody involved have thought about what's the pace and cadence of change that will get us to where we wanna be so that once we get there, if it's there, right? You don't have to redo it. And you know, that's why I say this cultural embedded. So it's, it's difficult. I think that I'm very mindful that it's gonna take some places longer than others. And I don't have necessarily a, um, uh, like a, this is what these schools will always look like and this is why it'll take them longer. I think that there's a lot of things to leadership and um, it could take, it just depends. But I will say the great news, and you heard Laura speak to this, is we have the district conditions Right, so as folks become ready and as we bring people on board, that the conditions are there to, so, to support folks being successful. Um, hey, since I'm timekeeping, I'm just gonna jump in here real quick. I wanna point out that we have kind of three more sections before I see a natural break. Um, don't wanna slow the conversation, but just wanna pace us appropriately. That would get us at a break maybe about by 10, 15, just a heads up. Um, and again, maybe this goes in the parking lot given the time, but <clears throat> one of the things I saw in uh, Shelley's evaluation of the strategic plan was, was feedback on the state of our, of our assessment system as a district. Mm -hmm. And so totally agree with the prioritization of MTSS and DDI, but it seems like one of the things we could do at the sort of governance level is support the movement in, towards a more modern, you know, more comprehensive and unified assessment system. Where are we in that? And could we turn that into a metric as well to, to the sense that that's coherent? Because that seems like that's a thing culturally in the district that is an obstacle to the implementation of this. It, it has been an Achilles heel. Uh, if you were to compare um, where our systems are versus where peer systems are, right, what you would see is most peer systems by 2010 <laughs> had set up very comprehensive formative assessment systems that had interim based assessments. And I would say that we've made a lot of progress there. I think, um, you know, if, if you don't have clarity and expectations for your system around curriculum and instructional practices, it's hard to have to roll out assessments and then, um, like they go hand in hand, curriculum, instruction, and assessment, they go hand in hand. So I would say that, you know, we've made progress there. We could speak to it. Uh, I would say that there's one area that we are probably maybe a year out from being where exactly where we'd want to be, and that's elementary school math. Because what we're trying to do in our assessments is align them to the curriculum that we're adopting, and we're in the this year we're going to be adopting elementary school math curriculum. Um, but we do have IXL, we have iReady, and those are skills based, not necessarily measuring the standards. Though well, they're aligned to standards, but uh, but not as tightly as maybe some of our others are. We implemented Common Lit. Maybe you've heard about that. We have Into Math in middle school, high school. Um, probably high school is the last one we get to. Uh, so, so in any event, yeah, yes, and um, I do think that that's something we could talk about. And uh, I'll let you talk, and then I'll let Laura, who's waiting to press the button to talk a little bit about this. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll just, um, my, my feedback on that would be that if, as we add, I totally believe in creating the instructional playbook and the clarity and you know systematizing this. But if we end up having the assessment driven by each curriculum decision that we made, then we're sort of undercutting the systematic nature of it. And so if we have eight assessments based on eight different levels and of curriculum, then we're losing sort of the systematic advantage of a more um, interim assessment system. It's tricky, right? I hear what you're saying. And, uh, you know, if we want to know kids are getting the standards and depth of standards in the curriculum that we have, like, is that more valuable or is it more valuable to have something that's aligned to the state standards at a high level year over year, grade over grade? Uh, or can you do both? And, uh, I think those are things that we'll have to contemplate. Okay, turning it back over to Laura and, and Chris. 
Uh, so maybe the most prominent recommendation we heard from Shelley was the uh, support of implementation around MTSS. So we, we often say the MTSS is the way we, we operate, meaning we use team-driven shared leadership to I identify um, the right supports for students at the right times. And really the, the nuance of this is how we go about supporting a high quality implementation around this. And so um, of course data-driven instruction also falls within MTSS and it falls within tier one instruction, how we support you know, students in, in mastering those standards. So uh, in thinking about how this aligns in those potential implementation strategies, it's applied specifically to academic intervention. You'll notice that MTSS goes across multiple areas of focus for us, but then calling out specifically how it is applied to academic intervention and that ongoing support of data-driven instruction. And then in terms of alignment to DAC recommendations, again, data priority two, uh, recommendation two, shift three and four. Um, there's a specific thing that, that DAC called out as an identified root cause hypothesis of gaps in tier two support prevent students support prevent students, especially young people of color and children from low-income families from assessing needed interventions before special education is referred. So we, we feel like there's even direct alignment with that hypothesis in terms of, of what that root cause is. Uh, so we're really excited to be able to address that. When it comes, and this is not for today, but later, when we need to dial into the UIP, we've been talking about improved fidelity to MTSS for as long as I've been involved in the district and we're continuing to talk about it. So I'd be curious when later, when we see the UIP and some of those details about clarity on the root cause, what are we gonna do differently this time around that we haven't tried before so we can really make some progress. So that's just one um, earmark I would like to make on that because we do talk a lot about improving MTSS structures and we continue to struggle to move the needle there. It's probably the hardest thing for teachers to do. Right, when you think about differentiating ex instruction, especially on, especially at tier two, and just like to get out of the education ease, think about tier one is I'm the teacher, I teach the entire class. Right, after I teach the entire class, some kids don't get it. That's tier two. And then after I do some other interventions, some kids still don't get it and consistently don't get it. And, and then that could potentially be tier three after you've given them interventions over time. Um, so, you know, I, I would say that the promising practices that I think we have evidence that, that, that are being implemented is data-driven instruction, because when you have data-driven instruction, then you're looking at the data and it quantifies the kids that aren't getting that tier one instruction, right? Um, and to Alex's point, you identify those through not just how their grades, but also through, you know, these formative assessments that you use, right? And then through the tier two, right? Like, like I think that, that the, the place where this can fail in classrooms and in school districts is when you go from tier one to tier three with no intervention. That's how MTSS is different than, oh, you're not learning, you need to get tested for special education. Oh, you're not learning, you must not understand the language. Oh, you're not learning, you know, as opposed to what, sometimes you need a second cut of <laughs> instruction. So uh, I, do th I do think we have some strategies. I do think that I don't wanna minimize the challenge of MTSS, especially in classrooms where you have large percentage of students who need tier two intervention. Uh, it gets, it can get complicated. I don't, I just, in my experience over the years, I think that, that um, I've watched leaders, superintendents, others say, well, just differentiate. Like it's some easy magic wand that you do. And it is the hardest thing to do, I would argue as a teacher. So, but I, I do appreciate that point. But you can't do MTSS if you don't have expectations around instruction, you don't have a data system, you don't have the assessments lined up, like, so, but it, but it is, it is complicated. Uh, thanks for discussing that complex, because I think it's really important, especially as we think about differentiation. You know, as you think about disproportionate identification here, really bringing in the cultural competence piece that it's gonna look different for different types of students, and to Bab's point earlier about um, um, emerging bilinguals, uh, um, being a particular group that's vulnerable here and might be falling through the cracks. And so thinking about how we can link up the cultural competence, professional development part of it, the DDI instruction, and then the differentiation part of it, I think is critical, especially because I know the recommendation was we need to target, right, in terms of where we want to make the difference and not have these kind of general approaches. Um, <clears throat> I'm, again, fully on board with the prioritization of this and the, the impact it has. 
I would draw another connection too to our long range <coughs> uh, enrollment patterns. Because I, I do believe that a bunch of the, and I look forward to more data to un explore this hypothesis, but I believe a bunch of the students and families we're losing are those that are in need of greater differentiated instruction and tier two kind of services. Or in schools where our tier one is failing to deal with a large proportion of the kids that are atypical. So <coughs> I, I think um, I would bring the metrics on the MTSS into the long range uh, enrollment pattern discussions and try to marry the two a little bit more so that people understand which students leave uh, and that there's not just a consequence that we can't instruct them, is that we won't even keep them um, if uh, we're not figuring out how better to differentiate. And MTSS is the way to invest in the system to help support them. Well, if you all like this presentation, you'll love our <laughs> declining enrollment <laughs> presentation that we were queuing up in a month. Uh, similar feel, similar type of deep dive. What are the hard questions? What are the things we need to answer? How granular do you get? How do you make data available that hasn't been in the past? All those types of things. So, And so we absolutely agree with the need for cultural competency to be built into our tier one universal um, administration of standards-based instruction. and as well as ensuring that our students are receiving that high quality tier one instruction, which led us to really examine the root cause. So the root cause of our past UIP had been identified as an inconsistent use of student level data and uh, to inform instructional planning and an inadequate variety of interventions. And th that's work that we've done. We have resourced those better. We've built those d uh, data driven instruction systems over the years where we really know that we need to go next and a deeper analysis of the root cause is um, knowing that we have an inconsistent application of MTSS <coughs> structures in each school, especially with regard to tier one instruction and, and to an extent monitoring of interventions. And so it's everything that the board has mentioned as well as what Dr. Anderson spoke to, the tier one, the tier two, and also the MTSS system. So we have systems built and we really are in that change management process to ensure application um, and um, consistency across all schools. And, and that is really speaking to how we want to tackle the student performance priority of disproportionate identification into special education, which we continue to see as a data pattern, which we also know um, implicit bias is a, a part of. And, and all of that lends itself to identification of this as a student priority that we want to tackle. Um, one of the things that this brings up for me um, in reviewing the materials today was, I'm kind of curious about how much collaboration time staff have in order to really successfully implement MTSS to the question around disproportionate identification of students with special education. I, I think about how the most successful teams are teams that have intentional, dedicated collaboration time, plan time to really review data, utilize our data-driven instruction opportunities um, to really have MTSS implemented with fidelity across our schools. So I'd be a little curious, <coughs> it's a hard question to answer, but I'd be a little curious about where do we have teams that are having the opportunity to collaborate and do these deep data dives in order to, to really um, move the needle on disproportionate identification for students with special needs, if that makes sense. Yes, I completely understand where you're coming from. We know the number one need for educators is time to do the work that um, they need to do to serve our students well. And so as we've evolved, even our professional learning and late start time to continue to directly support the strategic plan intentions, we've built in more of that time, less time where teachers are in, um, sitting and learning per se, and more time for collaborative time with their peers for DDI, for MTSS, and then our executive directors of schools are in direct contact and support of our um, principals to support them in shaping, planning, and collaboration time that is very intentional and gives teachers the time they need to do the work that they need to do. We definitely heard through teacher advisory council, through feedback on professional learning that teachers need more time, and so we've built more intentional time starting last spring, but definitely throughout this year too, and we hope just to continue to expand those opportunities, because we know to do meaningful work, we need to give time to do that. And we have to shift time, right? There's, time is a limited 
there's just a limited resource, right? So to the extent that we're able to provide a better instructional playbook, research-based interventions, make data collecting and record keeping easier, then you free up the time to collaborate. And then just one other comment around MTSS, and this isn't necessarily a, um, a BVSD statement, but what I've, just what I've seen throughout my career. When we start looking as tier two, as not a path to get them to tier three, but to get them back to tier one, then we'll arrive. we will have arrived. Everybody understand what I'm saying? So, like, I think MTSS has been, well, uh, oh, we've got to go through MTSS so we can get them evaluated and, uh, and, and, and get that, as opposed to tier two should get you back to tier one. Like, so that's the, that's the question that just is rattling around in my head. Uh, as, as a part of that? I think um, getting parents involved in that conversation is really important in terms of the mindset of what we're trying to achieve and, and figuring out what's best for individual students as we as kind of work through that part of it. And I, I think um, that kind of communication, I think, is really important to kind of figure out kind of where we want to go as a district and what our goals are. I, I, wanna, <clears throat> I guess I would offer one friendly amendment on that. Uh, channeling for our neurodiverse student advocates is that it's okay to be in them in tier two uh, because that's who you are and you need that level of support and customization to you that's not trying to fix or cure you but actually help you succeed in school um, so <clears throat> I would just add that not everybody needs to get out of tier two sometimes tier two needs to work for everybody and and I will say that as a I don't want to spoil the the presentation but when we when we think about um, not spoil it, like ruin it, but like get ahead of like what someone's going to say. That, that didn't come out right. Uh, that uh, you can use MTSS for behavior as well. And I think a lot about the stories that I heard two summers ago from, from teachers who do that intuitively, right, and teachers who have not built that skill set where uh, to the extent that you need to make accommodations for individuals so they can access instruction, Alex, to your point, uh, you can do that around academics, but you can do that around behavior as well. And that'll be one of our things that we're talking about where We've been calling it MTSSA, academics, and MTSSB, sort of behavioral intervention. So uh, just as a expanding and kind of growing the ways that, that we're, we're looking at things and being in responsive to the needs of our community. So we're really excited about this next recommendation of expand and enhance career discovery. Uh, as we know over the last couple of years through the success of Grad Plus that Dr. Anderson shared, uh, we've seen uh, and improving proportionality and advanced coursework, overall increase uh, for students accessing, uh, accessing industry certs, um, work-based learning experiences, college credit, seal by literacy. Uh, so within this focus area, we, we really plan to um, increase the exploration prior to high school. And what are those career exploration opportunities, PK through eight, and how are we identifying the right coursework and clearing those paths for students as they identify that, that career interest? and ensuring that they have access to, to reach whatever dreams that they have post-graduation. Um, so we're excited to build upon the success of what Grad Plus has provided and knowing that we have opportunities uh, to increase uh, career exploration prior to high school. And so what we're tackling here is the priority of um, knowing and understanding that there is still a disproportionate yet improving representation of students of color in work-related academic experiences, including internships, work-based learning, industry certifications, and advanced coursework. Uh, our past UIP root cause that we were tackling and certainly have made much progress on was a lack of clear acceleration paths and systemic barriers to enrollment and accelerated coursework. That's work that we have been, our team has been very intentional in making improvements around for the last couple of years. And so evolving that root cause and really digging into where we are now, where, where we want to go, we still see an inconsistent recruitment of students for advanced learning and work-based learning opportunities. And we know that we have a limited, um, we have some limited options in work-based learning opportunities. So this is the area for our next expansion of ensuring more proportionate um, access to these opportunities. If I can, <clears throat> one of the other uh, discussions I've been in over the summer is with our friends in Nederland. And, <clears throat> and I'm really curious to know how we as a district can move forward to identify the obstacles that different uh, communities have. 
and I, I think of both like our, our mountain communities on this front, and I, and I think of our alternative education campuses and, and how we integrate them into this. I realize the size overall is smaller, but the obstacles are different. And so as we think about expanding this one, I'd, I'd really like us to think about um, geography as another level of granularity when we look at it. I think this is the appropriate time to bring this up. I was interested in um, the section here about kind of the opt-in versus the opt-out with accelerated uh, enrollment options for students. So it sounds like the whole concept around automatic enrollment in advanced courses as a, as a policy um, implementation as a way to get some more students who are historically underrepresented in our, in our advanced uh, programming. So it's something I want to learn more about. Um, I don't know what kind of, I, I, we want to talk more about obviously the financial implications and scheduling and all the unintended consequences of a policy change like that, but I would love to get more information about that. I think this is the appropriate time to bring that up. So just so I understand, what you're suggesting is that, um, that we would automatically roll, enroll students who qualify into advanced coursework. <coughs> Uh, as opposed to having a conversation and allowing the parents and kids to decide that? I'm interested to learn more about some of the uh, policy shifts that have happened in other states and other parts of the country around automatic enrollment for students. It's a, my understanding, and I don't know, because this is what we need to learn more about, is that what's happening in other places is students are automatically in these advanced courses without having to be identified or qualified, and then they have the option to opt out of it as opposed to the option to opt into it. So it removes some of the like systemic barriers for students with you know, underrepresented, historically underrepresented students to get into these programs as opposed to, it's like a different approach to the, I'm just interested to learn more, that's all. Yeah, no, I'd be interested to learn more about that as well. I do think that they're, you know, I think that what's enticing about something like that is that uh, you get the system out of the way, um, and then ultimately, if you do something like that, uh, and some folks, I mean, it's, you know, AP for all is kind of an example of something like that where, you know, you, you know, it's this idea that college uh, credit in high school is not for the elite, it's for the prepared, right? And, uh, and, then, and then some kids need additional supports with that, whether it's AVID or Adelante or whatever that might be. But then you also have to have a safe place for kids to downshift if they feel like this isn't working for me. So yeah, I'm interested to learn more about that. I had a similar question, so I appreciate that, that point, thinking about the gatekeeping and, and kind of what that looks like and what, how we expand access for opportunities for kids who want to do this and, um, and, and kind of facilitate that. But not just at the individual, but thinking about what's available across schools as well, to kind of uh, Alex's point about, you know, um, a physical space, but just what's what's available at different schools and what it looks like in terms of uh, accessibility. So we continue to hear from our community and our staff and through the evaluation and DAC recommendations, uh, the importance of ensuring equity remains a focus within our strategic plan. And this objective really calls attention to the learning environments that students are walking into every day. Um, how we're uh, embracing restorative practices when appropriate, and that schools are consistently applying um, the recommended resolutions for specific disciplinary events. So how are we adhering to a consistent disciplinary framework as a district? Um, this is also where you're gonna see us expanding how we talk about MTSS in a very clear way. MTSS applied to behavior and how we're using that database decision making in order to best support students from a behavior aspect as well as an academic aspect. Um, so it's as, as well as professional learning around how we are supporting uh, teachers with the practices that are critical to ensuring that students feel like they belong and that well-being be at the forefront of this focus for the next five years. This is also a, in terms of recommend, recommendations from DAC, uh, recommendation two, shift one, two, and three. Um, we, we also see some real implementation strategies here at the status release. Uh, some information that we are really excited to get more into in terms of uh, a landscape for well, well-being and belonging for students, uh, identifying some high leverage strategies that we wanna talk about how we can implement here in BVSD as a part of us uh, uh, working towards this mission. And, and I would just say to, to add a little bit of depth into that, 
um, you know, this idea of student well-being is bubbling up everywhere, right? I think that um, as we think about the work we're doing, right, whether it's the evaluation of what we're doing for social emotional learning, some of the work that we're getting ready to tackle around Title IX, um, you know, the work that we're talking in regards to, you know, bullying and, and some of these other things, I think that in our community, student well-being is a an emerging and important topic. I mean, we talk about cell phones, like, like, like it's, it's, it all comes around this idea of what can we do collectively with our community to take care of our kids and make sure they're well and okay so they're able to access their education. So uh, as we think about these through lines, um, we don't wanna lose equity as a focus because we know that it's critical, but we also wanna embrace this idea that let's, we should be leaning into the well-being of our kids and doing the things that we need to to make sure that we're in tune to our community and whether it's a neurodiversity policy, a cell phone policy, whether it's Title IX, whether it's evaluating what we do, uh, to take that seriously and do that incredibly well. And what we know is that for students to feel that they're valued, that they're included, and to enhance their well-being, they need to feel and be connected to school, and that out-of-school suspensions have the opposite effect of that. So we are keeping our eye on the root cause and the data around disciplinary uh, procedures and who is or is not being excluded from school. When we look at our past root cause, it was all around um, inconsistent gathering and use of data. Thanks to Kathleen Sullivan and our student support services team um, and Vortex meetings, uh, our system has improved greatly in the gathering and use of data and understanding the patterns in each school we do believe, um, as Dr. Anderson pointed out, though, that implicit bias still runs through our system, and it is contributing to leading to inconsistent application of uh, criteria on students' actions and a determination around um, uh, the assignment of consequences for students. And so we want to continue to lift up our need to pay attention to the disproportionate number of students of color, students who are FRL eligible, students with IEPs who are having one or more out of school suspensions, knowing that that contributes to whether or not they are experiencing um, well being and belonging and feeling valued and included in schools. How are we training on implicit bias at this point? So, we have just hired our amazing new Director of Equity and Inclusive Teaching and Learning, who is working right now with our team to <coughs> uh, con determine what trainings we're going to continue. We did have. Um, trainings throughout the last couple of years, um, uh, Courageous Conversations, Glenn Singleton uh, focused trainings. And um, however, Floretta, or Flo King, is building uh, opportunities for continuous implicit bias trainings that are embedded and explicit in our PK-12 meetings throughout the year and also will be embedded and explicit in our teacher professional learning throughout the year as well. And, and here's where where I think that w once, you know, <laughs> let's let Flo get her feet underneath her, right? But like once we, like, like the place that I would dream and aspire to be is we look at our data results, we see teachers, right? And we look at the data, we see teachers where their discipline is disproportionate, and then we pair them with training and supports and resources, right? Like, in, in I think I, we've been explaining it, I've been explaining it to our leaders, right, uh, around improvement, how hard is improvement when you're already doing really good or you're making improvement? How do you continue that? And we've been framing it around the Olympics, right? That, you know, that it, when you're really, really good, you have to train incredibly hard to get incrementally better. And uh, so we'll have to get more specific with our tactics, right? You start out, you do trainings, you offer trainings, you folks opt in. Then you start driving those trainings to folks that you've determined need those trainings or could benefit from those trainings. Um, and then ultimately you, you can continue to make progress and growth. So uh, I'm, I'm excited um, that, that Flo has joined our team. She comes with us with a breadth of experience around addressing this very issue in higher ed and in, in interviewing her. She, you know, she knows what happens if we don't get it right here, what happens at colleges and universities. So uh, um, amongst kids and, 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 uh, and academically. So, uh, so in any event, I, I appreciate that, that. Yeah, and that, I would that. just put a plug in for that it is it should not be optional for anybody in our district to not be trained in this. 
Absolutely agree. And that's one reason why we're building it into already required meetings and trainings and professional learning. Just real quick, do you, and maybe you don't know the answer to this, but by embedding it into other trainings, do you think there'll be less resistant resistance? Because I can picture some teachers who would say, I'm not racist, I'm not biased, I don't need this training. But if it's embedded, so I'm just curious what your thoughts are on that, because I think it's great. I think you're right, there's a whole spectrum of self-perception around a need for learning more about our own biases, which every human does have biases, we're born with them, um, or they develop early on anyway. And um, I do not mean, by the way, racism, I mean that each human has biases yeah. um, about particular aspects of um, preferences. And, and so um, that's why we want to have it be a part of how we do business rather than something s separate. That's why we're building it into, so it's, um, this role is now equity and inclusive teaching and learning practices so that it becomes just really part of how <coughs> BBSD approaches our work, how our teachers self-reflect and our leaders and how we find ways to um, continue to expand on how we can affirm and build on the assets of the students in front of us. Okay, so that is 20 through 24 successes and the alignment with DAC recommendations and our strategic plan review. Um, would folks like to take a quick break? Metrics is gonna take a while. I was gonna say we're less than halfway through probably and we're halfway through our time. So maybe a quick break if everybody feels like they need to stretch. Cool. Welcome back, board members. We will resume our conversation on the proposed plan. Okay, go, go back to... So, uh, next topic, pretty, like, 10 minute, more conceptual than actual um, any content, and then we'll dive into metrics, and then we can kind of talk about next steps as we think about uh, moving forward with UIP, moving forward with, with metric development, moving forward with dashboard development. And so why don't we go to data availability and granularity. Oh, back, back one slide. So uh, board members, one of the things that we promised when we came, when we, we shared that we were gonna have this meeting was to have a calendar, a proposed calendar on uh, how these things align and what your touch points were on, on uh, strategic plan, UIP, um, and how it integrates with you. So we have our, our, our session today where we're really kind of shaping and getting you know, some you know, feedback on kind of direction we're going. Uh, we'll, on September 10th, you will have the UIP for study plus CMAS data. That's coming to you in an information and study item. Uh, the September 24th would be the date for you to approve the UIP. Uh, and then that has to be approved by October 1st or November 1st, Jonathan? Or it has to be submitted? By October 15th. Ah, so there you go. All right, so if we do that, that gives us plenty of time. October 15th, we have a session just like this, right, where we'll have some more direction, we'll have some more, a different conversation, right? Because it'll be more about not what are we gonna do, it's like how are things shaping up? Uh, and then December 17th, another session just like this, uh, as we as we prioritized, and then we put two, we just put placeholders in February and June uh, to have two more conversations with the idea that we'd have four in a typical year, right? Pl play this out two three years, you'd have a typical four times of a year check in where where we can dig into stuff where we can think about things um, uh, in this type of a format, and so that is what we're proposing. Uh, and we'd already voted on everything but February and June. If you all give us kind of a thumbs up on that, then as we prioritize, when we set our next prioritization meeting, we'll build that, we'll build these in ahead of time. So thumbs up sideways, thumbs down, let me know what you're thinking. Okay, all right, very good. Questions? Sure. 
Um, I guess one of the things I'd be interested in is uh, aligning this with like the calendar of data availability. And so when we think about strategic plan, I'm sure it's the next level of granularity for this is like, okay, when's yep. the grad rate? When is the you know, dropout? That's start? right. Yeah. And then uh, th we'll, we'll, uh, this is what we have. So go to the back to the, the previous slide. So as we think about data granularity, and you're going to look at metrics, here's, you know, the question that, that we have to ask is what data points and granularity are needed for monitoring progress and helping with improvement? What are the things that need to be standard and where do you have to have the abilities to be able to, to zoom in and zoom back out to know and understand what's happening? And I think that for us, as we think about data systems, we want to build in the right levels of granularity um, and data to be able to do that in ways that help inform improvement. I would say a big question that I ask is, uh, I think about this in two ways. First of all, it's kind of like, uh, you know, the story of Goldilocks. Right. Do you, you have too much, too little, or just right? I think one of the things that sticks with me is we worked really hard to build a, a previous set of strategic plan metrics. We engaged community. Uh, we talked about proportionality. We talked about things driving our improvement. And yet, I don't know that our community engaged with those metrics in the ways we would have hoped. Quite honestly, if I think back to all of the emails that I've received over the past five years, you won't know I receive a lot, and of all of the board work sessions we've had, the board meetings, with all the challenges, issues, questions that our community had, I don't ever remember anybody referencing our old metrics for any of those things. So it's like, that's, that's kind of sticking with me as we design this. Um, so, so uh, you know, too much, too little, just right. Too complicated, too simple, just right. And the other question I ask is, is the juice worth the squeeze? Right, like to the extent that you could spend a lot of time and effort analyzing things, when does that make sense? And when may, might not it not make sense? And I think those are the questions that, that I ask ourselves, I think we have to ask ourselves as we build a system that's useful, that's transparent and helpful for um, all the different types of stakeholders we have, and whether it's teachers, whether it's DACs, whether it's, it's the community at large. Um, I think that those are the things that I ask myself. And to that point, I asked our team to think about what's the information we have and when can we have it, right? To Alex's previous point. So, and how does that align with these four areas that we've bubbled up? and what exists here and what needs to exist here for us to have the information that we need. Um, and so this is a super busy slide. Uh, I would say that um, it's something that we'll have to probably dig into and revisit as we think about the different types of data points that Claire is going to go through. She's going to talk to you about leading indicators, KPIs, and then implementation. Um, and so we may come back to reference this slide as we start to have that deeper conversation, but I wanted to introduce it to you so you know that the work we've done ahead of time is think about what information do we have that we already collect, when do we get it, what's it aligned to, and how do you pair this together so we can prepare the right quarterly updates for the board, the right dashboards and, and, um, and data views for our community and anybody else who'd want to know how we're doing. Uh, so those are like the big things that we're thinking about in terms of data. And for folks that can't maybe read all of that very clearly, <laughs> at the very least, can we just talk about what the different color indicators are to give a section, like an idea of the section. So grade level standards are in red, tiered supports are in purple. This slide. All the well-being and inclusive measurements would be in that green color, and then post-secondary preparedness. So they're color coded based on those four categories. Um, we're getting a copy for everybody. And then, yeah, okay, they're connected you. Okay. in connection you. with You don't want, you want to take away? <laughs> yes. So that, those are the buckets. <laughs> oh, OK. No, we didn't. We only got copy. The whole slide deck was not posted to board docs, and that's great. That's fine. But for some of these, only Alex and Guy. Yeah, let's get this on an 11 by 17 for everybody in color that wants it. Uh, and, in, and there's a couple things in there, too, where we could have potential different data sources, right? Like you'll see our mental health evaluation, our Title IX evaluation. There's no checks there because once those are done, 
they may identify things like uh, maybe maybe it informs our school climate survey maybe it informs some other type of data gathering maybe it informs some other type of system so in any event okay at this point I am going to turn the presentation o over to Claire who's going to talk to you about how our team has been thinking about data and then talk about some of the possibilities and then you know my hope is that people are engaging and interactive in this piece so we know and understand what resonates with board members and um, where there might be some opportunities for some different thinking so Claire I'll turn it over to you all right thank you good morning everybody um, excited to be here and talk with you about data um, so um, as I've been brought into this project uh, when I tried to think like what's the really big question that we're trying to tackle here it's how might we measure our strategic plan process? So that's why we um, wanna be really purposeful when looking at our data. Um, thinking about all of the potential data sources that we could look at, all of the things we measure, um, I really wanted to strike a good balance and help to identify um, a few things. So one, we want our measures to be valid and reliable. Of course, that's the gold standard, so making sure that um, these are things that we measure consistently and accurately and we're confident in them. We want measures that are representative of all of our students, so um, things that are measured widely across our whole system, so that's kind of um, another uh, lens we're putting on this. Um, measures that are aligned with each of the focus areas of the plan that we've been talking about this morning. and. We also need to identify data that helps us to answer very specific questions. So I wanted to start by just sharing what are those buckets um, of how we're thinking about um, organizing and presenting all of this data. So in one bucket, we have our key performance indicators, and that's really where we're gonna be focusing this morning, and your hefty printed <laughs> packet has uh, many of those dashboard concepts with the key performance indicators. So focusing on those, the, um, what we're really trying to answer with our KPIs is did we meet student outcome targets? That's what we wanna know. These have to be focused metrics. Um, we will use them to set our annual targets of performance of how we're doing. And so these are typically summative or end of year results, as you'll see. You'll see CMAS, PSAT, SAT, et cetera. Um, in other words, these are lagging measures. Another level of data that we do look at and we will be sharing more throughout this year are leading measures so these are the kinds of metrics that help us answer whether or not we're on track to meet those student outcome targets how are we doing through the year before we get to that end of year measure so these have to be tightly aligned to the key performance indicators we use them to monitor our prog progress towards those specific targets that we will be setting um, and these are more interim frequently updated and then another level, and this has also come up in conversation already this morning, would be implementation measures. So with those, we are trying to get at, are we implementing our plan as intended? How is it going? These are more focused on adult actions. Um, you know, how well is DBI being implemented across our schools, for example? We use these to monitor progress on our action steps, and these also get updated multiple times per year to help inform us on, do we need to pivot, make changes in our plan? Okay, so um, what I will share next um, is sort of the global dashboard that brings all of this together into one snapshot. That was something that we did hear from the DAC recommendations was to provide um, easily accessible snapshots of our data. So I'm gonna start there, but just know that we also will spend a lot of time stepping through all of the drill down concepts from there. Um, so more specifically, we will be looking at, first of all, a few key groups. So we'll look at some trends overall for all of our students in the district. We will also look at trends for um, students eligible for meal assistance, or we also refer to that as FRL, and then students who identify as Hispanic, Latino. Those are kind of our first cut, kind of key focus groups. And then we will drill down to about 10 additional student groups to really get into the details of the data. Um, I'll mention, you know, we've had some mention about we wanna be, of course, incorporating 
data from emerging bilinguals, our gifted and talented students, students served through IEPs. Um, I've also heard feedback of, um, for example, looking at students uh, with Middle Eastern or North African backgrounds. Some of these groups, that's a group, for example, that we don't have the data on at this point. That's not a category that um, the state has us collect at this point, although we anticipate that will be coming online as that's a group that's added to the census. So um, I can take questions about that as well of which groups are included, which are not um, at this point. Um, all right, so I'm gonna step through kind of organizing this by our focus areas. So um, our first focus area uh, in terms of a key performance indicator, we want to be able to answer the question of did students demonstrate mastery of the standards? So our proposed KPI here are the state summative achievement results. So here's the snapshot level um, of that. And this is also, you do have this printed. Um, so what we are looking at here are a combined metric of percentages of students who are meeting or exceeding the standards in literacy and math and we've combined CMAS, PSAT, and SAT. And this is the latest 2024 data that's being shown here. So, yeah. Just a question, you said by it's combined those four, our CMAS, PSAT, and SAT, is it, are they given equal weight or how is that shown here? Um, it's just, I mean, essentially by it's not weighted, so it's, yeah, um, we're just combining the whole cohort of students who took any of those tests. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, so PSAT is uh, 9th and 10th grade, then SAT is 11th grade, yeah. So it does break out by grade level, and we'll, we, we'll show that later, too. Yeah, got it. Claire, why don't you run through all of these snapshots, and then sure. you can pause? Okay. Uh, because then after that, you're going to go to the drill downs, and I think that's where there's going to be a lot of interest. So. All right, sounds good. Um, so our focus on tiered supports, that our key question there is, did students achieve academic growth? So that is looking at um, the state summative growth percentile, so those same tests that I just mentioned, um, but now a growth metric. For post-secondary preparation, we want to know if students have pursued opportunities that prepare them for post-secondary pathways. So that's all focused around grad plus. There's a lot packed in here, but what we look at globally is um, did students pursue an opportunity and achieve in at least one of the areas of grad plus? And then we look specifically within each of those four areas, college credit, industry certifications, CLFI literacy, and work-based learning. Um, and then, our fourth focus area of looking at student well-being and inclusive practices, we want to know if students are experiencing positive and fair environments in school regardless of their background. So we pulled a few metrics together to look at this. We are including student responses on the school climate survey. We have a suspension rate metric. And then we also have a metric that is focused on use of restorative practices in our schools. Uh, could, could you talk a little bit about how to interpret the um, uh, growth percentiles? Yeah. Um, yeah, so those follow the Colorado growth model. Um, and so what they look at is uh, comparing students to their academic peers. So the state um, creates these cohorts of students who perform similarly in one year and then looking at their growth from the prior year to the current year. Um, and so in terms of percentiles, you could say, um, for example, in reading, all students, we have a median growth percentile of 55. So um, at the median, um, a, a student who had a score of 55 would have performed better than 55% of their academic peers. Um, typically for growth percentile, the sort of standard rule of thumb we look at is 50 as a good comparison point of making good growth above that. Um, <clears throat> can you explain a little bit more the theory of change that leads to growth being considered a tiered support 
versus achievement and growth both being based on grade level standards and instruction. I mean, I think the median growth percentile gets us at the median student, and a bunch of our tiered supports are for atypical students. So at some level, uh, it's, it's not necessarily focusing on <clears throat> the right kids on the performance spectrum that our tiered supports might be touching. Now, of course, the, the median growth percentile will go up with a strong set of tiered interventions, but I don't really see the logical connection between tiered interventions and the growth percentile as opposed to the CMAS achievement data. <clears throat> so we measure achievement with like the CMAS and the PSAT and we get the score that people have. And then we measure the amount of growth that a student has from one year over the next to get the growth measure. Mm -hmm. Both are measuring <clears throat> how well the student is doing in English language arts or math. Now, when we do the median growth percentile, <clears throat> we are finding out all the students of a subgroup and how much growth they made from one year to the next. And as a median, that's the one that's right in the middle. So that's the, uh, what is the amount of growth per year that the average student had? Our tiered systems of supports are frankly not for the modal or median student. They're for, they may be in terms of performance, but there's something else going on that puts them outside that. So I, I'm not sure um, that makes sense then. So if someone is struggling or someone is high performing, they're pretty far from the median. Um, and so it's, it's really helpful to understand the system in terms of its performance to look at that, you know, 50% kid and say, what, how much are they growing? Then you get a sense of what's going on. But we could be doing terrible with kids in the 0 through 10th percentile, and we could be doing great with them, and it would not change the median growth percentile. So how would you suggest we look at it differently, I guess, is my question, now that I understand what you're saying. Uh, that's a great question. Um, I'm not sure. I'd love to talk about it more. That's why I'm asking sort of, you know, what's the theory of change that leads to the assumption that the median growth percentile is the right measure for that? Um, I would think I'm much more interested in knowing um, what's the median growth percentile of the people in Tier 2 um, or the students with disabilities or the multi-language learners and then breaking that out with subgroups by um, free and reduced price lunch amongst those students or multi-language learners and Hispanic kids. Mm -hmm. So I, I think we'd get a better sense looking at both achievement and growth for like across tabs. And again, I don't know how to make turn that into a KPI because it's too complicated, but I'm not convinced that um, growth, meeting growth percentile captures a tiered support. So Rob raised his hand, then I saw Jonathan leaning in if Jonathan had something to add after Rob. I, I, don't, I don't think it's that complicated. I, I mean, because, and, and states do this differently. Right, in Colorado, I think all the measures have been designed to include all kids, right? So median growth percentile is one way to look at a set of data to see who grew or not, right? So look at the bottom quartile of students, what, what percentage of those students grew. I mean, you could s slice it up by quartile, or you could say of the bottom 25% of students, um, what, num what percentage of those kids met benchmark or didn't met meet benchmark? I think that we have the information we could look at it in different ways. Um, I will say that uh, you know, in, in designing these, and I'll let Jonathan and, and Claire add in, I think that we can do any of those things and look at things differently. General public, when they, dis when they hear about growth, they're gonna look at it like this. So the question would be, right, do we have a more complex set, right, as we think about tiered supports, right, one that looks at everybody, but then one that looks at um, students who weren't growing, are they growing this year? Uh, and then could you potentially look at kids that we're giving interventions to? And I mean, then you'd have to ask you, do you want the median growth percentile or do you want the percentage of students who met benchmark or the percentage of students who increased their growth? I think you could slice it any way that you want to. Every kid has a score, right? And so then to the extent that we create the algorithms to break that out, um, I will say that, you know, the navigating between the public's going to see and then what we do, the more complicated we get, the more, um, I think, uh, just public um, instruction <laughs> we, we need to do. Uh, around that, but I would say, I hear what you're saying, Alex, and I do think that there's different ways that we could slice that, and we could do one of two things. We talk about that now. We can 
hear this, hear the sentiment of the board and, and go back to the drawing board and, and give some different ideas and thoughts and bring something back at a, at a later time. For me, this does bring up what we're putting um, public facing versus what we have access to so that we have a greater understanding. Um, you know, I'd like to understand kids with IEPs, what's happening with their growth. Uh, our GT kids, what's happening with their growth. So I, I think I would be more interested in a deeper dive, but I, under, I really want to acknowledge what you're saying that for general public consumption, this would be the measure that somebody might come in and look at. So do we have two different dashboards? I mean, that's, I guess I'm interested in having that conversation now. So I know as we're looking at this presentation, are we talking about what we're, what's outward facing or what we have access to? Well, what Alex is talking about is a more um, precise measure. If, I don't care the subgroup. If you do a median, right, you're taking, you could have 10 kids get 100, right, and like 10 kids get, and then your average is 50. <laughs> so it's, it's you know, a, a median growth percentile versus the percentage of kids who hit a threshold it's, it's almost a different way of potentially looking at it. And I do think that the conversation that we have to have, right, is what granularity, but in this, what we're talking about is measuring it just, just the same but differently in a way that tells, tells you, all right, you know, our theory is if we do these interventions, X percentage of kids that are getting tier two support or tier three support or what have you are gonna outgrow their peers, right? Now, you've got to also think that the way that our state does this is different than other states. In other states, peer groups get down to the, I scored a 50 last year, and I measured against kids who were absent the same number of days as I was that are also on free and reduced lunch and also have IEPs, right? And here, it's just they get measured against everyone. So uh, states do that differently and nuance that differently. So. You know, if we're saying, you know, like peers from a test score percentage, not like peers in terms of other demographics or challenges uh, or aspects. Um, so we're getting kind of technical. You got to lift me up if I'm getting too technical, but I want to answer Alex's question. I understand that. Like, so, like, we could, we could model some different things on what that might look like. Can I jump in? It's related to both Alex's question and Elenia's. What will that help us do differently with different slices of data? Not just for this particular question, but as we work through, like, what will it help us do and under differently, or help us? How will slicing and looking at different parts of data help our public understand, or will it create more confusion? So those are some things that I'm holding um, as we go through these conversations, as it relates to our role, as it relates to teacher slices, which are very different, and they have different views versus principals. Where, I mean, there's all kinds of different slices. Um, but for the role of each individual, what is the slice that's most appropriate for them? The more accurate the data is, right, as, as we're talking it here, the higher someone's data literacy needs to be to understand the difference, right? You know, to understand the difference between a median growth percentile score and the percentage of kids within a certain quartile that grow, or the percentage of kids within a certain subgroup grow, right? That's a different, like it's how many kids are crossing the line versus the average time of the kids it took to cross the line, right? Like if I had to like quantify that. Uh, and so we would have to work with our team on some of those things. I would say that, th but this is the challenge, like, you know, and this is what I think we ran into the last time we set metrics. We want them to be statistically accurate. We have a highly educated community, some of which are very in tune, and we always want to be transparent and have data, that, data that's, that's real-time, valid, and reliable. And when you get to a certain level of data literacy needed to understand what we're doing, how many folks then don't get access to the data and understand it? I'd lo love to hear from Jonathan and, and Claire on this one. Um, I, I, I do su suggest we have the time at some point to, to dive into the deeper level. And I'm totally sensitive to what goes into a KPI that is publicly consumable. But, <clears throat> but, when, but when you've got a measure that is uh, 
uh, it's really not speaking to the question that you think you're talking to. It doesn't help that it's simple or that it's understandable if it's wrong. <clears throat> and I think uh, trying to get at the tiered supports through the median growth may suffer from that problem. So I'd like us to find uh, something that speaks to the students that are receiving the tiered supports, um, which for me, there's no obvious connection to the median growth percentile and the students receiving the tiered supports. So that's where I'm like, okay, well, is, is, is there a logic to this and, and what would be a better measure of that? And I, I am a proponent of, um, I understand what Alex is saying that, that this needs some work on tiered supports and I don't understand what the answer is because I'm on the lower end of data, data literacy. I'll say that right now, like I can, I understand what you're saying, but I'm definitely not at your level of it. Um, I do think that one of our roles is accountability, holding accountability. And that's why I think it's important that we have access to it. I don't necessarily think that you have to overwhelm public with it and you wanna have the correct thing out there for the public, right? Um, but I, I am gonna put in a plug here for that we have access to it. I think that's super important. I'll let Jonathan speak next. Um, what you will have access to, the public will have access to. Like, so it won't be like, so, so but that doesn't mean it's not public. It doesn't have to be public facing, right? To your point, like, but it's not like we're going to look at something different than the public would be able to access. I think that that has to be the case. So, uh, but you could do it a couple ways, right? Like, it, you could do it as we're measuring this to measure a superintendent's goal, or we're measuring this to measure a uh, um, ROI on a certain incident. Like, you can do it in ways where it's there's some sense making for the public. It's not just a bunch of data that folks don't understand why we're collecting it. What question is it answering? Um, and so, I, this is the kind of conversation we're hoping to have around these things, right? Like, these are first cuts of this. Um, I know folks want to talk, and, I, and then I'll, I know Jonathan wants to talk too. Maybe Jonathan can speak, and then other board members. I think Kitty had her hands up, and then Jorge. So I um, really appreciate the, the clar clarification that the question isn't as much about the, the growth metric per se as it is about what group of students is the ones that's measured there. That, that um, as far as the logic of, of keeping the overall group, right, the, the, the way you move a, move a median is to move um, a large number of, a large number of kids. So, um, so you're, you're right that if your target is 20% of them, or 25 or 30, um, that, it's, that there's some wish to be able to focus in on that, that group. I would point out a couple things. One, that at some level this puts pressure on the accuracy of our ability to say who is every kid who is getting um, anything that's within t t tier two. And, and, I, um, and, I, and I think as we think expansively about what tier two could mean, that, that you know, we'll, we'll have to think about that and, and figure out what the best metric is too. Um, yeah, but that there are also other ways. I mean, we tend to look at data in multiple ways to, to, to see the picture. For, for systems that support it, we would look at the percentile, the achievement percentile gain from one season of testing to, to the next. So there are, there are other metrics we would, we would, we would add, um, <clears throat> but I, I do pr appreciate the willing, the want to focus on this and the, the question about how we should do that best. I really appreciate the point raised about you know who the who the appropriate group is and being able to make those meaningful comparisons. Um, I think my question was from the starting point was making this um, accessible to, to parents and families. And, and as we look at our dashboards, you know, the, and I think back to the DAC, the hardest point was to understand that median growth percentile. There's a it's a median, it's not an average, so it means something different. It's growth, so it's change over time, right? And what comparison is. And I think having that information available on the dashboards to explain how you interpret these and who the comp appropriate comparison is, right? That the, 50, the median is 50, 
for overall students, right, 50% below and 50% above, and, and having that information available, I think, it, it just to make it useful. And, and we can workshop some of this stuff, right? Yeah. Like, like, so to the extent that, you know, we get feedback from the board, some different cuts, more feedback from the board, let's go out and just workshop it with our community, what makes sense, what doesn't make sense, what needs to be public facing, what needs to be driven internally to whether it's superintendent goals or ROI, like, you know, categorize that. So we have the information. So folks, we want to make sure, you know, to, to answer everybody's questions, right, and be as precise as we can to know if the things we're doing are working or not working, right? That's, you know, an important part of getting better. Um, and so this is all great feedback, great, great conversation. I was just going to suggest that due to time we could move on because I don't understand any of this, but I'm not going to ask any questions. I understand what the words mean, but that's it. I'll figure it out. I have one question um, on the well-being inclusive practices. We have historically measured ourselves around that question about my teacher cares about me in the school climate survey. There are other questions like looking at the survey, I feel like I belong. I am accepted. Um, I feel like I'm a part of the school. And so I'm curious if we're thinking about well being, we have a host of questions that are available that we have some historical information on. Why, um, why do we continue to use the My Teacher Cares About Me? Just a question there. I just think that that's the metric that we had established so you could have year over year clarity. There's certain, certainly opportunities to get better, and, and, and we can bring that back to our team. And if it's if it's the survey questions and a combination of the questions that make sense, we can roll that up in a better, different way, for sure. That's easy. Um, I think that in Claire, you remember, now, now these, are, you know, these are Claire's first cuts to show you kind of how we can look at the data. I'm, I'm really appreciating the depth of the conversation. Um, and here's, so here's what I'm hearing. And she didn't get to go through post-secondary preparation well and being an inclusive practices, so I'll let her kind of go over that if she, if she thinks that helps. Um, I'm hearing tiered support, work to do around tiered support um, in regards to how do, we, how do we dial in to know how many of the kids in tiered supports are learning, or growing or not growing, achieving or not achieving, and how do we unmask that from median growth percentile to some other way to demonstrate that how much they're growing and, and, and then kind of like think about that. And then well-being and inclusive practices. This, you know, really thinking about maybe, you know, some kind of a, a combination of other questions over time. So we, we could go back historically to compare. You'd have a historical comparison as long as the questions already exist in the climate survey. Uh, and, then, and then wrapping that up. And uh, we can collect some board feedback on that through, through just kind of conversation and then kind of move, move in that direction there, too. I heard Dr. Anderson say he wanted to talk about the post-secondary preparedness quadrant, and then I saw Alex raise his hand. So I want to address both of those. Uh, I just want to clarify one thing. Um, I'm a huge fan of the Colorado growth model and its application and its utility to solving these problems. So I'm all about finding a solution that uses the student growth to understand those things. My only concern about the current one is that we may be missing where, where the kind of actionable data is. So like if your top performing kids aren't growing as much as they should, then that's sort of what's GT for, you know, growth. And if it's in the bottom quartile, that's a totally different solution set. So that's why I'm, that's my feedback there. I, I'm a total fan of the growth and I think it actually intuitively kind of makes sense to, to parents, even if they're not dealing with the details of how it works. And then on the inclusive piece, I'm a total fan also of what social sciences would generally do, which is to create indices or indexes of these things. And so rather than pick the one measure that makes the most sense, we're like, what is holistically or comprehensively is how do kids feel in this school? And if we have data from re repeatedly from a bank of questions, then I would build an index on it and say, what's the, what's the well-being index change? Could you speak to indices just a little more for those of us who don't know? So if you ask people five questions on the survey, you can figure out which question is most important. And you might say, oh, this one is, correlates with an outcome we care about. So that's the most important thing. So I'd be surprised if the, a teacher cares about me may correlate the strongest of all five questions. But if you really want to understand the nuance in a place, and like if you did a case study of the school, you wouldn't just ask that question. You'd ask people all five questions, and then you'd, you'd do analysis and think about it and try to make sense of it. 
So the, the statistical way to make sense of it is to, to, to add up the scores of the, all five questions and give a point or a weight to them and say for each one where, you know, you, this one's twice as important as the others, so it gets a little more weight. This one's not as important, but it gets one point. And so you end up, instead of having five questions where you get a 4.5 and a 3.2, you end up with a, you add up all those numbers, and then you say, oh, this school has a 17 out of 20 possible points. That's better than a different school that only has 11 out of 20 possible points. And you end up with a more comprehensive, holistic view of what's going on in terms of well-being. And then you can adjust those over time. And we have some pretty sophisticated survey data from our own instruments and the state's instruments that would allow us to say, you know, it's doing pretty good, but, but Title IX, the women don't feel safe in this building, right? And so then you have a difference between women not feeling safe in a comprehensive high school with a history of sexual assault from a, a high poverty school where um, kids feel bullied and under-resourced and disproportionate discipline to playing at. So it captures different things, but still allows you to prioritize which schools have a low score overall. I would say the, the one question I'd have on that is yes and, right? If we know that schools with higher populations of certain subpopulations, right? If all schools aren't the same, right? From a breakup standpoint, right? And we know that certain groups of subgroups of students are feeling certain things systemically, that when you put a score on a school that has a disproportionate number of students, you know, in, in some type of subgroup, and people are comparing that school to another school who doesn't have those challenges. How do, how do you lift up that nuance? Right, like if I were to do this on discipline, there's like five schools that have more discipline than other schools, right? And, and those five schools have more kids in poverty, right? And whether they're, like, it's, it's when you get to, the, to that piece for a school, right, how do, you, how do you level out for that? I do like the idea of an index. I do like the idea of getting more precise and persistent and, and holistic. I don't think one question is probably the, th the, the way that this board or, or anybody really wants to move forward. And so let us play with that a little bit. I would just say that the one thing that when I think about this is like, when you do something to a school in a place where a third parents pick a school different than their home school, right, when, when, you, when, you, when you dial something in specifically to a school, you could potentially impact enrollment patterns, right, that could potentially compound issues at schools because of something that we've presented that, so I'm just super sensitive to that because I do think that declining enrollment, enrollment patterns, all the rules and regulations around that, how those all jive into making sure that A, we're saying yes, you know, schools are doing well or not well, and if they're not doing well, we need to help them and support them or hold them accountable, surely, right? But I think that that would be the one thing that, that, um, that we should consider collectively. Okay, um, I would add, like, this is a great conversation. I'm really enjoying the feedback and um, hearing these ideas. And I think, too, that um, our approach of looking at, you know, this is, again, the level of the key performance indicators, but also having leading measures that we'll plan to bring back multiple times during the year, um, I think will help a lot with this, too, in terms of having multiple data sources, cross-referencing, and really helping to put together a more complete picture. Okay, um, anything else for this slide? Or Okay, our next piece is um, for each of these focus areas, we have lots of data to look at. Um, I have prepared these draft drill down view concepts. Um, so here's the first one. This is diving into um, looking at grade level standards and instruction. First, again, by those same three focus groups that we've already looked at. So the drill down here, at the top level, those circular charts, that's still showing the same information you just saw on the dashboard. Then below that is showing the trend over time. So for example, in the blue, um, those line charts are showing year-to-year -year changes in percentages of students who met or exceeded the standards, broken up by content area. Um, same idea when you look down through all of the green charts, those are FRL eligible students, all of the orange charts are Hispanic Latino students. So I'll give you a moment to take a look at that. And just a point of clarification, the reason that um, FRL and Hispanic Latino are the two first subgroups that we pull out is because the end sizes are the largest. So 
So um, as we go from there, the next page, this is starting to drill down into some of our additional groups that I know like we also always look at and need to talk about as well. So the next um, view here, this cut is looking at a drill down by race and ethnicity categories. Oh, thank you. Sorry, I did that on my computer, not the screen. Thank you. Um, so drill down by race and ethnicity categories. Again, you can kind of follow it down in a column. So we have the group labeled at the top. We've got the um, 2024 results of meeting or exceeding um, standards, and then the overtime results in the line at the bottom. So I would like to have a conversation here about end size. Okay. And you can see very clearly when we have very small student populations, how it makes ch any change, like the first, the, in the bottom left corner, a change of a couple students <laughs> makes that chart look very different, um, or that graph look very different. And I, and that is the case with data when we have very small sizes. You see there's a higher degree of variability and fluctuations as the, as those small numbers move. And how is that useful to us? And for somebody that's not data savvy, what might they take away from here that might be more or less beneficial when we show these small sample sizes? Rob? So what you could do, right, um, is create some outlier criteria where when a subgroup, regardless of end size, you know, makes big changes one way or the other or is not accessing something one way or the other, like you could create some type of a, of a like a rule, a data rule, where when that happens, like there, there could be something lifted up so we don't lose it, right? But we also don't overemphasize when you go from, you have the same number of students, black or African American in reading meet in the benchmark and you go down by 5%. Like that can be confusing, however, Right, like if any subgroup goes down, you know, I don't know, you, you set the rule 10%, we're gonna lift that up. Or if they go up 10%, we're gonna lift that up as, as an assurance to our community that we're not forgetting about any students, right? But uh, it's not as useful to look at the every day, but we should have a safeguard to say when it hits certainly, then you all as a board would know, hey, there's big changes here, plus or minus, and we're gonna look at that. Because then you could do deeper dives to see if there, is there is there a subgroup that's not getting access to something? Is, are they not getting access to interventions, advanced courses, like what is it? And so you could set some rules up on that so it's not a always have, but if the rules hit, then it comes up. And then a follow-up, and then Elaine and Alex, sorry, what for student privacy, when we have these small samples, do we have a district-wide policy on where we stop reporting because there are I'm thinking as we get more granular to site bases or different things where we, it really becomes easy to identify specific students, being cautious about that, and if we have a district sort of policy or practice that we could ha that you might want to share now, so we're really clear on where that becomes a student privacy issue as well. We've we've followed the, the number that's. <laughs> CDE has, which is an which is an N of six, 16. So if you're reporting an average, it should be that based on that number, or if you're reporting the incidence of something occurring for a group, the group shouldn't be smaller than 16 at that school or the whole district. Um, so there's some further elaborations on it we can do about when you report by categories, then it then you know you th some some more little things can get added to that. But 16 is generally the number. And obviously, there's a pretty big run, 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 runway between 16 and the point at which you want to show cha changes of a point or two on a, on a scale as being something you want to lift up as opposed to saying, um, look, this varies. This is made more complex by participation rates so that you can not only have groups that are basically small, but one or two different students participating in a g given year um, will, will help drive that also. So, uh, yeah. Even as novice as I am, I do think that I understand end size pretty well. And I think that if we have those, um, if, if we're clear with our public that there is 
an end size component here. I think that's good. And I really appreciate seeing it. So I'm a proponent of as long as we are keeping those privacy concerns top of mind that and we are having a disclaimer on end size, I do think it's appropriate to be sharing this data. I will say that this affects granularity, right? You can have district-wide cuts, right? But, you know, most of those, you know, with those subgroups with 38, you know, 20, maybe even 160, like it might prevent you from getting to, to school-level data, so. I think it was Alex and Kitty. Um, <clears throat> I really appreciate the discussion of the end size and, and what to do with it. Uh, in my day job, we work with um, a gentleman out in California who's been analyzing different state accountability systems. And, and one of his standing recommendations, which Colorado doesn't do, is to really get to confidence intervals and you know, probability ranges, so <clears throat> which are totally a function of, of cell size. So um, it, it'd be good to know that a difference of going from 40 to 41 percent or 61 to 64 in a group that small, like, is no statistical difference to someone who knows what's going on statistically. So I don't know how we do that in Colorado. It's an advocacy point Rob can maybe bring to the task force that they would in include the Have you been watching the task force meetings? <laughs> <laughs> well, but it's better than, I, I do believe there's a responsible way to share the data and the confidence interval or the probability that it's different is the way to discuss it while screening it. And I think it's really key to keep in mind that our people in our MTSS systems and in our schools need N of one data to work with so that they're talking about an individual child that they're trying to help. So you can have the desire to keep the um, granularity appropriate, get in the way of actually applying the data at the school site. So I wanna make sure that we are um, as interested in responsible transparency, coach people on it to the extent we can, um, talk them down when they're over-interpreting, you know, small groups, and then support the people in the schools who are doing data-driven inquiry about what they're doing. So. Yeah, I just want to make sure I understand what each of these numbers is, because I see the, in looking in the circles, I see the percentage. The number underneath is the N, correct? What is the number underneath where it says met reading? That's number of all students tested. Okay, so. Yeah, so the percentage met. Okay, okay got met, it, got yeah, it. So the, then all students. So the, the, the N in terms of testing is the bottom one. The N in terms of met is the top. Okay, I've got that. Now, looking down at the bar graph underneath, it appears to me, and I'm, tell me if I'm wrong interpreting this, but I'm looking at the first one under American in, Indian, Native Alaskan, under reading, it looks like, so, okay, these are, the ends here are just the numbers that met. Okay, Correct. now I understand yeah. why they're different. I thought maybe fewer people took the math test. Got it, thank you. Uh, I do think there's one other thing that would help people understand, and again, I'm a data nerd by nature. But um, I do think as long as you've got subgroups with much larger stuff available at the state, reporting state averages on these things for many of these smaller subgroups, make, like you look at this and you come away with a pretty profound, um, if you're doing the analysis and you have some data literacy, you, you see the achievement gaps and the opportunity gaps that are going on. And I think to understand and interpret those gaps, it helps to have the state averages uh, to show that's like, hey, we are doing better or worse than even the state on this measure, even though we have an apparent um, performance gap going on. And uh, that's something that I've been thinking a lot about too, Alex, is particularly where it feels like we're incredibly disproportionate, how, how can we celebrate, still show how we are doing compared to others? Because that is a, that we are, for a lot of our historically marginalized sub, subgroups that we call out specifically, we are doing better than our like districts and we are doing better than the state average. And so how can we have that in context? That context I think is really powerful for our community to understand, for our board members to understand. And so when that becomes available at this next slice after um, today, I think that would be a really important measure as we're trying to promote change here. Uh, to that point, I, I mentioned uh, Steve Reese, who I work with professionally when we work with school districts on how to oversee charter schools. One of his additional uh, strategies 
which is something that would take extra work or advocacy again at the state level, is to deal with sort of district-like district comparisons and really understand, okay, well, who do you compare Boulder to um, in terms of other districts, and who do you compare a particular school to compared to other schools? And so it's the growth measures trying to capture that, and the subgroups and the crosstabs try to capture that. But the other thing we could aspire to as a state or as the front range districts is having like, okay, well, what do, what do the districts of our size and similar demographics do with these subpopulations? So there's all sorts of ways to cut that that give us relative. I would say that speaking of the statewide accountability task force that I've spent more than 100 hours on, but who's counting, um, one of the things that, that I'm advocating for is a beating the odds measure, right? And so that is where you take school, but it's more the school-based bet versus the district, but it's the governor we're thinking about awards to hand out. Um, in addition to some of the, a district award would be a, a beating the odds district where schools with like populations are, over, are, are just performing better with similar context. It's something that we had in Georgia, and so I, I, I believe that's gonna be in the final report. I've advocated for that. For like districts, I think that we have some districts that we can line ourselves up with in Colorado, and I do think that there is a subset of national districts that we compare ourselves to. Um, some of that data is, uh, is not available uh, because of a data sharing agreement that we have with some of those districts who, uh, I mean, I just, if, yeah, there's, there's some complexities. It's for improvement, not for public consumption, but we do have some of that, but, uh, but I agree, and I do definitely agree with the context, right? And, um, and I think that that's an important thing that we can think about now that the data has been released from embargo today. So next cutback, we can, that's something we can look at. We have 30 minutes, so we're gonna have to let Claire do some talking, so. Okay, well, um, the next slide is very similar, but we're just cutting the data in different ways. So now we've got, um, instead pulling out our patterns among our emer emerging bilingual students, students served through special education, and students identified as gifted and talented. The same general concept here. Um, and then for this metric as well, on the next slide, we can also break this down by grade level. Um, and this will also break out, we've got grades three through eight, that would be the CMAS test, nine and 10, the SAT, grade 11 is SAT. So I have a question here um, on the bottom half of this. When we're comparing grades over time, it's not a co, we're not talking about cohorts. It's like how did, so there are different folks are taking those tests year over year and is this, the best way to look at this information and it, does it give us what we want or is following a cohort and their change over time getting at what we want in a better, clearer way? I just, when, as we're presenting this data, we need to be, and maybe it's just sharing this, it's not the same group of people and so we, there might be some variability that we would expect, but that's the one thing with this bottom half of the slide I would like to te talk through a little bit the benefits and risks with it. Um, I think the challenge with cohort data is that the cohort continues to shrink over time, right? Like if you have if you have a, a set of data rules, right? And we could do we could you could do it. It's more complicated. It's going to take some more work to kind of you know figure out who counts and who doesn't. And more of a big, big long data spreadsheet could be helpful. And then again, I think that these these data points can um, lift up outliers, right? You know, as we have these these uh, community events, different generations that are coming through, what are the things that we can notice, right? I mean, I think that the thing that I really like to know is, you know, the kids coming in third grade, you know, that helps as a measure. One we're struggling with at the, in our state accountability task force is how do you measure K-2? What's happening in K-2? There's a lot of critical work that happens there, and how do you measure that over time? Uh, again, these are data looks that, that we have. I do think that the cohort is another look can you, that you could have. I think that the limitations could be um, just that, uh, you know, you would have to figure out a way to communicate to folks that the longer, if the, lo the earlier you measure, the smaller the group becomes. And then kids who move, kids who don't stay in one place, right, it could, you, you have a different data set f five years down the line, which you're measuring is kids who've been in the system for five years, which may not be, I mean, I just think there could be challenges there. Jonathan and then Alex. And the, and the added ch challenge is in terms of the, the, the public, 
if they're if they're looking on the bottom line and they're following a kid from grade four math to grade five math to grade six math, you can see that those that those percentages aren't the same. So, so a member of the public following a kid, if we did, did this for a group of kids, right? We would see a number that got higher in fifth grade and lower in sixth grade, but it only got higher or lower, probably, because of where the the tests the test cut score was basically set. So, so we have we have ways we can we can do this, but they get pretty complex pretty fast. And then there's the question about finding a comparable data set, basically statewide, right? So, um, so it so I I. This is part of what I like about growth percentiles, is that they they, they do a lot of that work for you, uh, in some of those regards. But we've done you know we 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 work with this over over time, and it just it, it gets complex. Um, I have one suggestion in terms of presentation. I, I I think the the pie charts or the modified pie charts are best for comparing. Um, proportions within a within a single group. So if you want to know, is it a quarter people do X out of this and 70% do Y? What we wh when you're presenting a whole bunch of pie charts next to each other, the intuitive analysis is much more difficult. So like I would think that a, a bar chart or a line chart would be a bar chart probably makes the most sense for like this one. So you'd be able to see this elementary to middle school disjunction that Jonathan's talking about, right? And so, like now, an analyst, someone reading it has to go through, okay, 63, 65, 66, then 62. You know, they're doing that. And you miss out on the visualness that you'd get with a bar chart for the same thing. Thank you. I, bar charts are probably my favorite as well. <laughs> um, all right, so I'm going to go through, I think. Um, now that you've seen the concept, I'll go through these a little bit quicker because um, I've really applied pretty much the same ideas to each of the focus areas again. But I'll take a moment on this. Um, we're shifting to um, looking at our, sorry, let me make sure. Yeah, tiered supports, so looking at our growth measure here. Um, so this is again going back to our three focus groups. At the top of this page, this is the data that was in that dashboard kind of squished down into one corner of it, but looking at those median growth percentiles in each content area for each focus group um, in 2024. And then down below is the historical trend. So those are stacked up. You can see the year is labeled um, along the, uh, on the <laughs> rows, um, and again, broken up to reading and math. So just to orient to how that's laid out here. And then just quickly, I'll go through these and then we can pause for any more conversation, but um, then there's the same kind of um, scheme of showing that data now broken down by race, ethnicity, broken down by programs, and then broken down by grade level. Any thoughts on those visualizations? Do they solve different problems than the other looks or both? Just be, we're, we're gonna figure out a way to collect all of your feedback and information comprehensively. This is just kind of the initial thinking and different ways you can show the same info. Thumbs up, to, oh, good. thumbs up to move, uh, move on. Or Any? I guess uh, one other subgroup on the performance stuff I might suggest would be gender. So as I move us along, um, um, so now looking at uh, post-secondary preparedness. So this is this is a rich data set. Oh, sorry, jumping too fast. So this is a pretty rich data set. So again, um, I kind of went through this quickly before, but what we're looking at. So if we look at our top chart on the left side the metric is grad plus overall. So that's looking at, of graduating seniors, what percentage of those seniors achieved at least one or more 
of the grad plus quadrants. So that's sort of the bundled together metric. And then we do break it out by those quadrants and that would be earning college credit, earning an industry certification, the seal of biliteracy, or experiencing work-based learning. <laughs> and so again, um, the top chart, that's our class of 2024. And then below that, we have it broken down into a year over year of um, graduates and completers from prior years and then up to last year. I really like this look because it could show you exactly where our work is, right? I mean, concurrent college credit has gone through the roof, industry certs a little bit, seal of biliteracy. You know, we would hope that as our students are going through our, our Manhattan program and our Angevine program and our Casey program, that those numbers you know tick up as those kids you know start to matriculate, uh, and then work-based learning. Uh, you know, that's why it's one of our our areas within our, our focus areas around the disproportionality on who's getting access to that. Probably kids whose parents can help them out. <laughs> All right, so I'll just mention we've got then these same metrics broken down by race, ethnicity, and broken down by programs. We can't do a grade level breakdown here because again, this is just focusing on seniors. So also just a curiosity if there are other additional groups of interest um, to look at this data set. I, I do think it would be um, interesting, and I don't know what the results would be, but I do think this is another one where gender variations would be helpful. And you're just thinking like access to coursework, you know, how are we encouraging? Uh, yeah, and historical patterns of yeah. women not in sciences yep. at the yeah. college level, mm -hmm. or if we're doing a bunch of career placement and it's all uh, boys career placement and yep. things from traditional gender roles that are yep. exacerbating. No, that's that's good insight, yeah. yeah. Okay, um, so then I'll bring it to um, our fourth focus area on um, student well-being and inclusive practices. So again, this is bundling a few metrics into our one view. We start by breaking it down by our focus groups, but again, at the top, we'll look at our most recent full year of data. Um, so the survey question that we discussed, um, a suspension rate metric, and then um, again, I think I just quickly said we put in a metric about restorative practices. So just to clarify that a little bit more, what we're looking at is um, the percentage of students who um, had one or more restorative intervention out of all of the students who had a behavior incident. And that's specifically looking at students who were like directly involved, um, participating or the offender in that incident. I might be more interested in well, I'm, I'm not sure how we're looking at that. Will you explain it to me again so that I understand if it's getting to what we're trying to do with restorative justice? Yes, and thank you because we had a lot of discussion about this too because it is, it's tricky for sure. Um, and while it is, you know, restorative practices are a positive side, we don't necessarily want those to go up and up because that's also behaviors are going up. So where's the balance there? We've had a lot of discussion around that. Um, so what we, we wanted to have a metric that would reflect um, the practices and um, I mean really looking at how students are served with that as an intervention, as an alternative to suspension hopefully. Um, so just in our, in our numbers we can look at this specific code that is restorative intervention. That's something that we have clearly coded in our system. So we pulled out those numbers. So it's the percentages of students who experienced that resolution um, for an incident. And our denominator is all of the students who had any kind of behavior incident in the year. Are we looking at if the students who received the restorative practice are coming back again? Or if the students who are suspended are Resuspended because that's what I'm interested in is what restorative justice is trying to navigate is recidivism. 
And this doesn't seem to be getting it, but I'm not sure I know how to get it. Yeah, at this time, this doesn't. Um, and yeah, Ralph, did you have something to add for that? Well, I think that's right. I think the recidivism, like if you're doing restorative practices, restorative justice well, right, you, as opposed to, you're gonna learn from this consequence to not, to not do something again. You're gonna learn from an experience where you restore and make folks whole, but, right, but to your extent, uh, I mean, to your point, Lillian, I, that might be, let's, let us look at that. I think that's a, that you, I mean, theoretically, we have all the data points, you'd be able to do it, right? You, you know, you just have to write the right algorithms and then try to visualize it. And maybe both would be, would just give more depth, right? Like, you know, because some folks, it's just a one-time thing, right? Uh, And then piggybacking on what Lelania said is, is if kids, you know, quote unquote, reoffend, that's not the word, but if they have discipline again and they go again to restorative justice, was it for the same sort of behavior or was it a completely different kind of behavior? That's where it gets super complicated because you, you'd, you'd want to really dial it in on the same behavior, right? But maybe, maybe you might, I don't know. Because again, remember, as I was talking to you all about the discipline codes, sometimes they're multiple coded. So it'd be hard to isolate that variable potentially. But, but again, you know, let's think about it this way, right? If you get the data point where you're like, hmm, what's happening? Then you could always have the opportunity to dive down, right? Like let's, let's, let's you know, six months from now we're having this. We've come up with something that we're gonna do. One of the numbers doesn't look right. It's not, hey, the numbers don't look right, we'll do better next time. It's, hey, the numbers don't look right. What do we do next? Do we need to better understand the problem? Do we need to, like, you know, where do we go? Like these, these meetings, great data meetings, leave, you, you leave with some action, right, to do it. So to the extent, what's the stratosphere we want these measures to, to look like? And then what, what's our move if something comes in in the ways we don't want? Or want. And I, I think the reason to be looking at that recidivism number, for lack of a better term, is then we can know how much resource, that's the actionable item, how much resource are we putting into this? Because I think we, we've upped the resource, right, from zero, we upped it, but do we need to put more resource into it? And that's why I would be curious about seeing that question answered or the fidelity of the model, right? And I think that would, I'd have m as much interest in fidelity as resource to the extent, you know, what you'd want to prevent is people saying, oh yeah, we did restorative justice, right? And they don't, right, so. Um, two points, again, super excited to see all this. Uh, I think addition of indices to this would make it even more powerful. Uh, two observations, one for me is, I think when we think about the subgroups that we're looking at, we should be responsive to what we know about the, the issue. And so when we deal with issues around mental health and sense of belonging, we know that our LGBTQ students are suffering from these problems at much higher rates and incidences than their straight classmates. And so this is where I'd wanna see uh, gender breakouts and LGBTQ breakouts um, in order to really get at the students who might be um, heavily impacted by them. And I realize there's some data that's not tracked that way, but uh, like the survey and health data is tracked that way. And so we can do the breakouts if we include measures that are going from the ones that do. Um, anyway, so I, I think that would help us a lot. I would also say I would love to tie in the data, again, thinking about our long-term um, enrollment issues. Uh, I think one of the reasons when I talk to parents who have just recently transferred to our private schools is they're dealing with a discipline thing that didn't go right and the kid didn't feel safe, they felt bullied. So I do think that uh, not just the recidivism behavior but actually the exit from our school system um, should be something that's maybe not in the index, in the KPI, but maybe it's um, in the implementation data too is to note, hey, did we lose that student a year later? Because um, I think that's happening. I, I do think the way that we're thinking about that is is having se separate systems, right? Like that can inform one another, but 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 separate systems. And then to, to some of the data to your point, like I do think there's limitations on what we collect in regards to gender identity. I, I, don't, I don't know if you wanna to speak to that. Well, I mean, we, we, we wouldn't gather if it, there's, there's data at this point about LGBTQ um, 
but we but there there is some data on gender right so there there's a third or fourth category at this point in our system sometimes with enough end to, to, to report on broad district wide i mean sorry broad all grade measures uh, but but you you you're right you're we're referencing data from the healthy kids colorado survey Before moving on, um, this kind of made me think a little bit about the scale discussion, right? And being careful about how we scale different things, because we don't want to. We want to have the differentiation to look at things like a teacher cares about me versus I feel bullied in my school or I feel like I don't belong, because they're really capturing different dimensions. And so I think having that variability to kind of capture those different pieces, I think, is re is really important. So it'd be nice to see that. Um, so yeah, just to complete this piece out, so then for these particular metrics, we do have, um, again, the breakout by race and ethnicity categories, by programs, and then by level, so elementary, middle, high school. So board members, we have 12 minutes left. Time flies when you're having fun. Um, let's talk for a moment uh, around next steps for us. I think that we, we, we certainly captured feedback from the conversation. Uh, we moved pretty fast, so you all as board members might contemplate different things that you might want to ask about or speak to. Um, you know, our hope is to get direction on what are the things, uh, you know, what are the looks that you look like. I think we got some really good feedback there. Um, we've heard around, um, you, know, you know, feedback around this well-being index, weighting, nuancing, but also not losing the, you know, the, the, the raw data, right? So being able to kind of look at that. Uh, Alex has given um, some good feedback around our tiered supports and then how do you think about capturing that data in a way that better tells you whether the intervention for the subgroup, how many kids it's helping and not versus an average or a median. Uh, and so I think we have that feedback to go back. We've heard um, some of the questions around the usability of the grades. Uh, so I think what I would propose is, um, and we can do this a couple of ways, we could send out, you could send in your comments or thoughts, we could send out a survey again to get some direct feedback, but then I'd wanna follow it up with our one-on-one -on -one meetings to get context on what that is, and then I could take all that feedback back to the team, and so we begin to start building this out. Um, I, I, that's, that's kind of what my, my best thoughts are right now, but would open it up for folks with discussion, are you comfortable with that? With the understanding that, you know, we would do some work, we'd find a place to bring, we could bring it back at our next meeting to kind of say that based on the feedback, here's where we're looking, does it feel right? Do we still need to adjust? Um, or we could try to bring that back to you previously for another feedback before our next meeting. We just leave that, uh, Nicole, for, for the board to discuss. Can I ask a question? A lot of the questions I have, so all of these metrics are based on the KPI. I have a lot of questions about implementation metrics and like that's where my brain is going. And so I am curious to, to know, are we something similar for some of those other parts um, that we talked about at the very beginning about leading measures and implementation metrics? Or are we keeping this really focused on KPI and then pulling out some of those other things um, at different points in time to dive a little bit deeper, but our dashboards are really focused on KPI? I'm, I just have some questions there. Yeah, no, no, I think that, that we owe the board an implementation dashboard as well, right? Like so, and we owe that to our DACs and to our, uh, to DAC and to SAC, right? So I think that uh, given the way, you know, the way we measure Right, what subgroups we measure, right, is an important piece. Um, and then with implementation measures as we're building out and finalizing UIP, 
then what we can do is begin to bring that back for you and quantify that. Now, I think there's a couple of opportunities. I have to check with the team to see how long, like the, these are long, like these are pretty, once they're built, they're good, but building them takes a ton of time in the midst of the beginning of the school year. So um, I'll have to talk to Jonathan and team on what we think we'll have ready before we bring, can you pull up the calendar, the date, like the times we're bringing stuff back? Because what, I, what we'll need to kind of think about is do we need to have another, like allocate more time or is it the time that we have allocated to talk about this and develop this, is that sufficient? Um, who's driving the, oh, okay. I thought Chris was David, I thought he was leaving. Like, because we're supposed to, no, 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 no the cat, the count, the, yeah, go to the, the, go to the timeline. So we're supposed to bring back by September 10th, which is what, a month? Yeah, so, so maybe then it is that October 15th session we could dedicate to doing something similar with leaning measures and then any progress we've made on the other things. If you all are good with that, let's get it right. Let's spend the time, we have three hours. We are, we'll be much more on the same page than we were previously. Um, and, uh, and then we could do that on the 15th and that's what we would have that session for. I'm looking at the team, does that sound? Absolutely and um, one of the, the time consuming last steps in working with the, the kind of dashboards that you've seen from Claire is making them um, public ready. Uh, yeah, it might and, take some time and, for that. And so, so what I'm, it would be awesome if by the 15th we could have what you've seen, a variation on that public ready and operational and some thinking on leading the measures, it might be an or. Uh, or some beginning thinking on leading measures. I, we just, this is a, a busy season for Claire and everybody else on the team because of UIPs. Why, um, why, don't we why don't we put why don't we put our heads together, put together a proposal for the board and then, you know, as long as I think that we're working and getting this right, I mean, I think that that's the big work right now. Thanks, um, Alex and then other board members weighing in. Yeah, I just wanna, <clears throat> I, I wanna leave us with, with two thoughts. One is how grateful I am to the staff and Jonathan's team because this is a tremendous amount of work and really well done and a great discussion by the board. So I'm, I'm really hats off to the staff for what you've done. This is great. Um, the question I have, uh, not enough time to talk about it today, but I do think we need to get to it in subsequent discussion is what, what's publicly available at the school level. And so as a parent, um, people have a lot of interest in how the district is doing, but they really want to know how their school is doing on these things. And I know that that is like that level of granularity is available to the people in the school to do their, do their work. And we want to build a culture of that. But I, I, I would like this to move in the direction that it's okay for the parents to also have that school level data. And I know there's a reluctance around that. You've, you've talked about the implications of letting people see stuff that can affect enrollment patterns. But I'm much more interested in le empowering parents to understand how their school is doing than I, uh, and then letting that lead to improvement uh, that keeps the parents rather than the other way around. So I think we as a board should talk about what is available to the public facing at school level granularity. No, and, no, and I agree. And I think that that's, that's great for the 15th. You know, with our last strategic plan metrics, they were all available at the school level. So uh, now prior to that, that wasn't something that had been a practice, right? And so we, and so, so we have a, a history of doing that. Um, uh, yeah, just as long as we're thoughtful, you know, certainly want to be transparent. You know, you um, want to give folks the right context with data so the conclusions that they're making, right, based on the data that they give access to are right and un they understand. And uh, and I think that, that we can get there. So yeah, no, th that's good feedback. And as I say, I know the SACs at the SAC level are getting access to some of this data and having those conversations in their schools as well. So um, moving in the right direction there. Appreciate you highlighting that. Board members, other thoughts coming back to next steps, how this process went, last thoughts um, as we work, as staff work to prepare for the next meeting or the, our subsequent meetings on this topic. Beth. I just want to um, jump on the bandwagon for the Alex started and just to tell you thank you so much. This has been really helpful. It's incredible work. I know it is a heavy lift and I am really looking forward to our next steps. I think this is 
I, for one, feel like this went great. Um, I completely appreciate the opportunity to do this during the daytime, to really dig in and have these maybe a little more informal conversations with the depth that I think this board has really craved. So I'm feeling really good about the work we did today. So thank you to everyone. But the hand was raised, but there's a no, thumb up. Like, I can't quite see. Really need to give a... Um, I'll echo that I think this is amazing work and staff's done wonderful. And that I think we have to continue to explore um, data for improvement and data for public consumption. That is an exploration that I will continue to advocate for on this board. I think it's super important work and I think we, um, it's trust building work that we have to do. <clears throat> I'd also just love to, like to give Nicole kudos for a well-run meeting. I think keeping us on our agenda and the level of exchange we're able to have in this setting was really c constructive and efficient, so I really appreciate that. Um, oh, I just lost my train of thought. You should say your piece. Thank you for that. <laughs> Staff did the, the, took the lead here, I remember. One thing that I've been thinking a lot about at, knowing that we're on this path um, and that different boards with different levels of desire and comfort have taken different paths with data. If there is for our board members or folks that are watching these meetings that need some training up, I really want everybody to feel like they can access the information we have and if we need to take that time to train up to make sure the information that's presented is accessible or if some things feel more or less accessible depending on um, comfort level and experience looking at data, that's really important for us to know. I wouldn't want anybody to ever be left out of conversations, particularly as we get more technical. So how can we help each other? How can we help our public that's looking at that, at our data as we become, as some of this does become more publicly facing? It's just something I want to elevate and that there is no, um, no reason to feel like you can't say, I need help understanding this. Like we need to understand the data so we can ask the right questions so we know that the work is headed in the right direction. The worst thing we, I would, the worst thing that could happen, in my opinion, is somebody's not knowing how to understand the information that's presented and they're making conclusions that are not, uh, not accurate. So the more that we can help each other, the more that we can help the public understand this data, the better. And so if there's anything that we can do differently moving forward, please always let um, Rob Wright know. I just want to thank our team. Uh, I think, board members, what you, what you hopefully have seen today is, is the talent that we have on our team, the focus, the alignment with board direction and staff um, and staff work. And so really proud of the team, um, everybody here uh, that participated. And, and like Claire said, this is, there was a lot of folks not sitting around this table that had a lot of insight um, into this. I do think that there's great opportunities for improvement. I was sharing with some board members during the break that the the vision that I shared with, with our team is I want us to have the most comprehensive, transparent, and meaningful data dashboards in the state of Colorado, and I think we're well on our way. So kudos to the team. Thank you, board, for your engagement. Beth, you were the best timekeeper. Uh, and because it's noon, and we're, le and we're right on time. So great job, Beth. Thanks, everybody. Great job, Nicole. Great job, everyone, for your engagement. Thanks, everybody, for that thoughtful presentation and engagement. With that, that concludes our business for today, and this meeting is adjourned.